Okay, are we are we live? Are we? Uh, yep, seven o'clock. <clears throat> okay. Okay. Well, it's uh, top of the hour here. Um, good morning or hello to everybody who's out there in your part of the world. Uh, my name is Santiago Gasso. Uh, I'm a researcher at the University of Maryland and NASA. I'm located uh, in the East Coast of the United States outside Washington, DC. Uh, and I'm here hosting this third day of the Summer Solar School. Uh, today we have very uh, exciting topics. I, myself, I'm very interesting to, interested to learn from my colleagues and, and I hope for you, uh, also, it's a good experience. Uh, a couple of uh, a couple of uh, technical notes on how we are going to do today. We have uh, basically three sessions. Uh, we start with plenary sessions, and uh, and then we will do a practical for two hours, and then we do poster discussion and presentations. That's overall. Uh, we a couple of uh, additional notes. We uh, just a reminder: we are going to have in, we're going to be interacting through Huba, and if you have messages there, you can post them there, or you can post them here through the Zoom chat. Uh, we are going to leave questions and answers all the way to the end of the three presentations. So, if you have any clarification questions or questions, uh, specific questions to the uh, speakers, keep them for the end. We're going to have forty-five minutes, so there is plenty of time. Uh, a couple of reminders. Uh, I'm going to be just a talking head here. We have people in the background actually doing interaction with you, posting uh, links uh, such as the, uh, and things to find in Huba. Uh, that will be Paul and Becky. Uh, a couple of reminders. We are got, we're having uh, a competition, which is basically uh, we are going to be uh, evaluating the different posters you have been submitting. There will be a prize for the best poster and a prize for the most creative poster. This will be evaluated by the, uh, by the organizers here. But then there is also a contest for the best uh, photo posted by the students and that will be evaluated by everybody. You will have to just click and like it in the Hua platform. And, uh, and also will be a contest on the best social media posting and uh, uh, we're gonna be also you have to provide that information if you can post it in Huba. Uh, Paul should be sending out a link in Huba where to post this uh, and I think these are all the uh, introductory messages I think we're gonna we're gonna start to move into the plenary sessions we have like I said we have uh, three three sessions uh, three Presentations today. The first one will be Cecile Guillaume from CNRS and the Sorbonne University in France. Then this will be a general uh, presentation on theme three uh, of Sol Solace theme three. And then we'll move into a presentation by Morgan, who will be more of an application of what Cecile will talk. And then we have a, a different presentation by Eric, who will be discussing uh, issues of governance and Solace related topics. So I pass it on to Cecile and yeah, go ahead. Thank you very much, Santiago. And hello everyone, very happy to be here with you and to give this short presentation about atmospheric deposition and ocean biogeochemistry. I will give a bit of context about the question we have and how we can tackle uh, this question with uh, several approaches. So you may recognize uh, the cartoon that uh, is in the solar science plan about, about the theme three, atmospheric deposition and ocean biogeochemistry. And basically we have three main questions. So the first question is regarding uh, how natural and anthropogenic inputs from the atmosphere impact biogeochemical and ecological processes. The second one concerns the impact of atmospheric deposition on global elemental cycles. And here we've talked mainly about carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, and iron. And what are the feedbacks to the climate? 
And of course, how the global warming and over anthropogenic stressors alter these processes. So I will give first, sorry, I will give first a little bit of uh, um, example about emission <clears throat> and what's going on during the transport of those aerosol and uh, what what's going on after they, their deposition at the sea surface. So just one example uh, regarding uh, the emissions, and this is a very important case for nitrogen aerosols that are predominantly emitted by combustion sources, what we call the nitrogen oxides. And you see here that there are changes in nitrogen oxide emissions since 1850 that are very uh, showing increasing uh, emissions uh, in that time, and that there are strong also uh, regional imbalance. And what is important here to notice is that all the emissions increase over uh, that time, but the shipping emissions here in blue are really showing a steep increase. And this is very important because the ships are above the ocean. So when the aerosol are emitted, we can expect that the impact from those emissions will be very important. So what takes place when the aerosols travel uh, um, in, in the atmosphere? So I take here the example of dust uh, we, what, that we know are rich in iron, phosphorus, and trace elements. But they will meet a lot of chemical uh, in, in the atmosphere, and they will mix with those uh, different species. And I will give here the, the example of dust mixing with uh, uh, nitri nitri nitrate. And that means that at the end, when the uh, dust deposit at the surface of the ocean, it will be also bring uh, no nitrate to the surface ocean. <clears throat> there is also another type of mixing that is quite interesting concerning the pyrogenic aerosols emitted when you have big fires. So of course, part of those aerosols uh, do comprise biomass uh, composition, but there will be a lift of lithogenic particles with the, the heat that is very uh, producing connective uh, uh, movements. So at the end, those aerosols also have some lithogenic uh, components. And it's important to know all that when the aerosol do deposit at the surface of the ocean. So basically, atmosphere is a source of nutrients for the surface of the ocean. Iron and phosphorus are mainly coming from natural inputs, uh, meaning mineral aerosols, and that concern la large area of the ocean where our desert dust uh, is impacting, but other sources such as combustion sources, volcanic sources are also very important. And as I said, nitrogen is mainly dominated by anthropogenic input, and all those new nutrients will uh, end up um, partly at the surface of the ocean. Well, the question is how do they impact new production in, in certain areas? And of course, we don't have to forget about another important external source of nitrogen, which is the biological and denitrogen fixation. Uh, I'm not going to talk about that today. So there are still vast areas of the uh, ocean where we don't have observation. We still don't know in large part of the ocean how much uh, uh, aerosol bring nitrogen phosphate, uh, soluble iron, and silicate. We have a large area where we have few observation and most of them we have no observation. So using those data, we, uh, we need to, to refer to models to have an estimation of the deposition at the global scale. And of course, those data are used to validate those models. So this is what uh, I've been done in many studies. So you have here on the left a representation of the deposition fluxes at the global scale um, calculated by models for soluble iron, phosphate, and nitrate. And the big question is how uh, these source of new nutrients are influence, influencing the pattern of nutrient limitation. You see here a map of nitrate concentration at the surface of the ocean. And some experiments show where we do have uh, nitrogen and or phosphorus and or uh, iron limitation. So the question is really to understand and to identify area where the atmospheric deposition matters in these patterns. And this is the case, for example, for North Atlantic, tropical North Atlantic and the Mediterranean Sea that I know very well. But uh, this is obviously a concern, uh, the large oligotrophic area of the ocean where the nutrient, the in-situ nutrients are very low. Um, we still have uh, um, 
a lot of uh, area in the ocean where we don't have this knowledge. For example, in the Indian Ocean, we have a very few uh, indication of the limitation, and this is also the case for the southern hemisphere. So what are the approach we use to tackle those questions? We can do processes studies from bottles incubation up to mini cosm incubation up to very large mesocosm incubation. In those cases, we use a proxy of, of uh, deposition. In the case I show here, it's a proxy for dust deposition, where we are going to mimic an actual deposition and try to see the answer in terms of uh, nutrient cycle and biological impact. We need to couple those process studies with observation that can be from satellite, from floats, and of course, all the observation we can do on ocean during oceanographic campaign. And doing this, we can provide parametrization for models that are improving our representation on large scale. And we need also models to know what are the process studies that we need to tackle for the model to get improved. So it's a permanent uh, a dialogue between the experimentalists and the modelers that we are uh, doing. So I will show you a few examples. Here it's uh, the, the example of uh, the impact of dust deposition on dissolved concentration that were measured in very uh, large mini-cosm. Here you have three controls where you don't put dust. And here you have three uh, dust addition uh, mesocosm. And the gray bar here, the green gray bar here is the time where we put the dust on top of the mini-cosm. And you see that we have a very strong decrease uh, of, the, of dissolved iron after the dust deposition, meaning there is a significant transfer of the in-situ dissolved iron to the dust. And this is counterintuitive compared to many studies. In fact, we need to take into consideration, sorry, doesn't work. We need to take into consideration the in-situ uh, condition where the deposition occurs. And this is another study where we show that the in-situ organic matter is really the key uh, parameter to uh, the iron dissolution after dust addition. We did use the same dust, the same flux, but at different seasons, characterized by different dissolved organic matter in the seawater. And we see that it, we end up with an iron dissolution with one order of magnitude differences, uh, depending on the season where the dissolved organic matter has different properties. So that the iron dissolution, which is a very important parameter for the, the biochemical uh, models, is driven by process governed by the dissolved organic matter pool. So the dissolution of iron is not a magic number. We have to take into account a lot of parameters. So what is the fertilizing potential of dust? Uh, here I show an example of response of phytoplankton, where you see that as soon as you add the dust on top of the minicosm, mesocosm that are very uh, big uh, volumes, you add dust and then you uh, provoke a very strong phytoplankton bloom. This is in oligotrophic area. So we go from 0.1 microgram per liter up to 0.3 microgram per liter. So indeed dust fertilize the oligotrophic uh, systems. We did also some experiments to show that uh, the impact of nutrients is going to change uh, according to the future climate conditions. So this is an experiment that was done in the central Mediterranean Sea where the system is very oligotrophic, meaning very low concentration of uh, chlorophyll, very concentration of nutrients. So as soon as you bring new nutrients to the surface, you will have an increase in chlorophyll concentration. So this is in the current uh, climate, climate condition, dust addition, and in green, when you lower the pH and you increase the temperature. So when you add the dust, you increase uh, chlorophyll concentration, primary production, bacteria abundance, and bacteria production with very high rates. But it's even stronger when you uh, decrease pH and increase temperature, we show that there is a clear exacerbation of dust impact in the future climate. And this is something we need to work on for models too. So if we, if we take into consideration all the different experimental approach to study those process at the global scale, we can map those results that have been published very recently. And you see that there are very large parts of the ocean where we still don't have any idea of the impact of uh, aerosol in seawater. But if we take that for the chlorophyll 
exchange following the aerosol addition that can be mineral dust or anthropogenic or mixed aerosol or volcanic aerosol. We see that there is a high spatial variability in the response. We can have very contrasted response, meaning an increase when you, you go with symbol, symbols that are increasing, but, but also a decrease when you have um, uh, different colors in, in purple, for example, or even no change when you have those, those crosses. And this is depending on the aerosol type, of course. But on average, we can say that there is an increase of 80% of chlorophyll over the 70 experiment compilation. So we need to understand at the global scale, so we need to go for models for that. And uh, um, we did an, a representation using a model uh, Nemo Piscus. And this is what we obtain uh, for the chlorophyll change following deposition in percentage. And we can see that uh, on average, we have a 50% increase, which is consistent with the order of magnitude of the experimental uh, average. Um, and we can see also that there is a high spatial variability. And this is mainly due because the uh, in-situ physical and biogeochemical conditions, of course, are very contrasted uh, over the ocean. So the, the models are very uh, interesting because we miss a lot of collocated atmospheric deposition and in situ uh, observation. So when we don't have that, we can try to do a modeling exercise. Uh, we can, I, I, I choose to present some data from this model, couple uh, Piscas with Nemo. And this is a very interesting model because uh, it comprises atmospheric deposition, the several species of nitrate, nitrogen, phosphate, iron, and silicate. And uh, you have the response of many uh, different compartments in the, bio, in the biota. We did uh, uh, several deposition scenario, exactly when you, when you do an experiment uh, in your lab, you can do an experiment with your model. So you can tune the deposition to see what matters. And uh, if I show you this example in the Arabian Sea, where we don't have this type of collocated atmospheric and, and colon water data, you see that uh, these are the satellite observation for chlorophyll concentration. You see the very uh, high uh, climatology variability um, in, in function of the month of the year in different parts of the Arabian Sea. And we were able to reproduce the pattern of the chlorophyll when we add iron deposition only. We didn't reproduce the pattern with no deposition and uh, all the deposition except iron. So it was a way to show that the, really the input of atmospheric iron is necessary for phytoplankton to take up the available uh, nitrogen and phosphorus that are uh, in situ and to grow up to the observed profile by, by satellite. So without atmospheric deposition, we also calculated that the new primary production during the fourth month of the appointing activity here will be lower by more than 50% at the scale of the whole Arabian Sea, meaning that the aerosols, uh, desertic aerosol bringing iron are key in this environment. <clears throat> oh, sorry. Um, so I wanted to give you an example of uh, 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 results from observation. That was the first evidence that pyrogenic iron from wildfire can fertilize the ocean. And Morgan is going to detail that example. So I'm not going to talk about that, but that was to point out that uh, crossing the, the, the different way to observe the earth is very important here. It's a coupling between satellite, Argo flows data and iron aerosols. So please uh, look for the, the, the talk from Morgan just after. And uh, very recently also, uh, we had uh, uh, an important uh, um, uh, evidence that uh, following the very uh, important uh, volcanic eruption, I'm sure you heard about it, that was in January uh, near Tonga. And uh, thanks to observation uh, by satellite, satellite the, the, the authors were able to show that right after uh, the, the eruption, there was a very, very strong increase in chlorophyll uh, below the, the plume of the ashes. And the, 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 the bloom was very fast after the eruption and decreased quite rapidly right after. So that was really uh, the first evidence that an extensive phytoplankton bloom could be observed very shortly after a very big eruption. And that we observed an ocean fertilization uh, through the volcanic ashes deposited. Uh, that uh, really the, uh, 
certainly an iron uh, uh, limitation. So I want to finish with a, another uh, example that is important in terms of impact. Uh, it's about uh, the ballast effect. Indeed, the aerosols bring new nutrients to the ocean surface, but they also bring particles. And those particles, they can aggregate uh, organic, uh, dissolve organic carbon in seawater and uh, uh, pr provoke some uh, particulate organic carbon that may be exported. And this is what uh, we call the lithogenic carbon pump, pump. And this is so far really something we are uh, working on. And we are able to show that the production of this particulate organic carbon not related to any fertilization effect is a function of the lithogenic flux that reach the ocean surface. And if we uh, use a model and we uh, put this lithogenic carbon uh, in the model, we see that after a strong uh, lithogenic um, dust deposition, we can increase a lot uh, the, the, the particulate organic carbon export. Um, and this is something that is so far not taken into account in models and uh, we need to really tackle that question very seriously. So uh, for my concluding remarks, I hope in these few slides, I illustrated that the question related to them three are very complex uh, because aerosol do mix during their transport. And we need to consider all the source, not only dust that was a big uh, focus over the past decades, but we realize now how uh, important can be uh, pyrogenic aerosols, volcanic aerosols in certain parts of the ocean. And um, we saw that uh, dissolution and scavenging, that is really the mechanism that will bring new nutrient or not to the ocean surface after an atmospheric deposition depends a lot of in situ condition because the organic matter is a key um, a process with, the, with those nutrients that are coming from the atmosphere. So we need to consider that and this is very complex to, to tackle. Um, the duration of the event is very important because we, uh, we, we know that dust deposition, volcanic eruption, fires are uh, events that do not last very long in time. They, they could be very extreme event over a few days, for example, and we need to really uh, understand how such extreme events impact suddenly a uh, uh, natural assemblage. And of course, the initial state of the natural assemblage is also uh, something that is necessary to take into account to understand the, the fate of these atmospheric nutrients. So it's very difficult to provide a simple pattern of biological response. And uh, so for the, um, it's, it's even more complex. I, I just show you one example because the condition, the forcing are changing. Um, I didn't show that, but uh, there is a changing in atmospheric acidity and there is a recent paper about that. Uh, there is a, a change within the ocean. As I said, the pH is decreasing, temperature increasing. So there is an increase in stratification that could uh, also increase the role of atmospheric deposition in the future uh, decades. Uh, we all know that uh, um, we may have an increase in, in fires, meaning increase uh, of pyrogenic aerosols. So what is the future role of this impact of aer pyrogenic aerosol in the ocean? Uh, we really need to tackle those questions. And uh, we, uh, I, I guess the experiment that are going to be conducted uh, in now need to take into account uh, these evolving conditions into, um, uh, of the system. So as I say, I show some maps. Uh, we need more in situ measurement. Uh, you saw that in large undersampled uh, area, we don't have any data or very few data. This is not enough. And a very nice thing would be to have more time series that combine atmospheric and oceanic measurements. And to finish, I really emphasize on the fact that we need to closely work with modelers uh, to improve the parameterization of models that are able to let us uh, give us an idea what's going on in places where we don't have data. And of course, uh, we need those feedbacks from those models to know where we need to tackle a new question and improve our experimental uh, evidence that um, atmospheric deposition is uh, very uh, important. 
So with that, I will uh, thank you for your attention. I mentioned several papers in my presentation. I give you my uh, email here. So please do not hesitate to uh, send me email to request any of the publication uh, you may want to, to read after, after that presentation. Thank you very much. Oh, I guess, yeah. Oh, thank you, Cecile. Lots of fun. Uh, I have like 10 questions here, but let's do it at the end. Uh, so we're gonna move on to with Morgan Perron. She, uh, she's gonna be talking about uh, her work. One of the applications that uh, Cecile mentioned, uh, she did her, this work while she was working at the University of Tasmania. And uh, yeah, and I look forward to see what she has to say. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, I hope you can hear me well. Um, so I've been asked to present some research highlights. So I will be presenting three complementary studies investigating the Australian fire events from the summer 2019-2020 that Cecile has already nicely introduced before me. So this work was undertaken at the University of Tasmania, as um, Santiago mentioned. Yep. So in order to set the scene to this talk, I need to mention the chemical element iron. Um, very briefly, iron is an essential nutrient for most living species on the planet. However, in parts of the world's ocean, indicated by red dots on this figure, there's such low iron in seawater that it prevents the growth of marine microalgae. The largest iron depleted marine region is the Southern Ocean that are circled in red. Um, in the Southern Ocean, marine primary producers participate in capturing atmospheric carbon and sequestrating that carbon into the ocean interior. This phenomena helps regulating the global climates on Earth, but it is limited by the lack of iron in the Southern Ocean. As Cecile mentioned, um, there are multiple sources that are known to emit iron into the atmosphere, and this iron is then uh, transported within air masses and deposited to the ocean surface where it can be used by marine algae for growth. I hope you will see, yes. But on regional scale, different atmospheric sources will be more important to different marine regions. This was supposed to be an animation, but we can see it clearly um, as a figure as well. So this is a figure from the NASA, and we can see that the dust emissions in orange and the human activity emissions in white, thank you for the animation, dominates atmospheric emissions to the Northern Hemisphere. On the other side, down south, the green patches that we can see are biomass burning emission, and they seem to dominate atmospheric supply to the southern hemisphere. Now you'll tell me why don't all researchers from the southern emission focus on fire emissions then? Well, fire emissions are rather difficult to investigate because one, wildfires are hardly predictable because the collection of sample in a burning forest obviously represents major risk for human health and for the instrumentation. So one way to overcome this challenge is to collect aerosols kilometers away from the fire core. However, the smoke plume may or may not flow over new sampling location. And if you manage to collect some atmospheric samples, then how do you make sure that they include fire emissions. So there are a couple of challenges with investigating fire emissions to the atmosphere. One question that could be asked at this stage is do fire events in the Southern Hemisphere contribute to iron emission into the atmosphere? And does this iron um, impact marine productivity in the iron depleted Southern Ocean? 
So during the Austro summer 2019-2020, we faced the ideal case study. Uh, Australia was hit by unprecedented fire events. The fire smoke was emitted up to 35 kilometers in altitude. It drastically uh, disturbed the composition of the stratosphere, and the smoke was dispersed all across the southern hemisphere in a very short time. For this reason, these fire events from the summer 2019 2020 were uh, presented as the major weather events that occur since the eruption of Mount Pinatubo volcano in 1991. And meanwhile, in the middle of the Southern Ocean, a very unusual feature caught the eye of satellites. An abnormally large and long-lasting bloom of marine algae was observed in uh, the middle of the Iron Limited Southern Pacific Ocean. This is the red patch of chlorophyll A that you can see um, on the figure displayed. Now, the question was, did the fire emissions from Australia triggered this bloom of marine algae? So the fire events occurred on the southeastern coast of the Australian main island. The fire smoke was then transported via one of the dominant country's atmospheric pathway, which is the southeast dust path, which flows southeastwards over the island of Tasmania and down into the southern Pacific Ocean. Fortunately enough, at the University of Tasmania, we have been collecting weekly aerosol samples at the Kunini Time Series Aerosol Sampling Station since um, 2016. So we decided to analyze these aerosols and see if they had captured the signal of these large um, Australian fires. At UTAS, we measure um, the sugar level glucosin in aerosols, which enable us to track the presence of fire emissions in our aerosol samples. So we were able to split our aerosol samples between um, two groups, the aerosols which contain fire emissions and aerosols that do not contain um, fire emissions. And what we found is that iron concentration in aerosols containing fire emission was on average twice greater compared to uh, what we called background or non-fire containing aerosols. That was true both for the total iron concentration and the leachable iron concentration in aerosols. If you're not familiar with these terms, the leachable um, fraction of iron in aerosols is used as a proxy for um, the iron contained in the atmosphere that we think is uh, usable by marine algae for growth. I'm trying to get to the next slides. <laughs> yeah. So at the same time, in the same uh, fire-impacted aerosols, we um, saw that um, they also contain higher concentration of nitrates and ammonium, which are major nutrients for marine species, as well as higher concentration of manganese, which metal is thought to co-limit uh, together with iron marine productivity in parts of the Southern Ocean. So using these um, field-based measurements, we showed that the fire emissions from um, the summer 2019-2020 in Australia emitted a large amount of nutrients, including iron, into the atmosphere. And this data was combined with other research to tools in, in Nature last year, which aimed at investigating the link between high atmospheric iron emission during uh, the fire events and this abnormal bloom of marine algae that we saw in the Southern Pacific Ocean. So we'll have a look at panel B on the top right of the slides. 
here we calculated the five um, forward trajectory, which are the white lines on, on panel B. So these white lines uh, are a forecast of the trajectory towards which the fire plume was emitted. Um, so we can see that it was emitted towards the Southern Ocean where we observed the bloom. On top of that, the color scale on panel B represents satellite observation of um, the black carbon emission, which are associated with the fire plume. And what we see is that this black carbon representing the fire plume is shown to be transported towards the Southern Pacific Ocean where the marine algae bloom was observed. Then on panel C, we used a three biogeo algo floating sensor that I've put a picture um, at the bottom left um, side of your slides. And all these sensors reported the same measurement of high marine algae biomass in seawater between January and February 2020 in the regions where the bloom was observed. So these uh, in situ measurements were used to confirm the satellite observation of chlorophyll A of high chlorophyll A concentration in the Southern Pacific Ocean. And both in situ and satellite measurements um, indicated that marine productivity had indeed been stimulated in the Southern Pacific Ocean at the same time as the fire emission occurred in Australia. Finally, we'll have a look at the panel D, where a satellite based estimates of net primary productivity show that the bloom in the Southern Pacific Ocean was unprecedented in magnitudes. On this plot, the D plot, we see that the net primary productivity during the fire events of 2019-2020, that's the red bars, are much greater than net primary productivity in the same region during previous year, that's the blue bars. So using all these tools, this study showed that all these events successfully occurred in a logical way from the ignition of the fire in Australia to the transport of an iron loaded fire plume, all the way to the ob observation of a bloom of marine algae in the Southern Ocean. So we could conclude that uh, fire emissions from Australia in the summer 2019, 2020 had delivered enough iron to the surface water to trigger this um, marine productivity in the Southern Pacific Ocean. One last study that was published this year investigating more the bloom itself. Very quickly on this slide, on the panel A to the left side of the slide, the red area highlight the difference in net primary productivity um, between the 2019-2020 fire season, which is the top of the curve, and um, the net primary productivity during other, other years, which is the bottom of the curve. So not only the primary productivity in the Southern Pacific Ocean was much greater during the, the summer 2019-2020, but the bloom also lasted for up to nine months, roughly until um, July 2020, when it would usually start to fade around um, April or so. Then this bloom carbon production was then converted into an iron requirement on panel B to the right-hand side of the slide. So we calculated how much iron was required by the marine algae bloom in order to, for the bloom to be sustained for so long. And what we found is that the marine algae bloom was likely to have been sustained by two different sources of iron. So in a first stage, atmospheric deposition of um, iron rich fire emission to the, to the ocean would have triggered the bloom early on in the summer season. 
and sporadically fed the, the bloom so it can keep going until um, June or July 2020. But in the break time, recycled iron had sustained the bloom. So recycled iron occurs um, in the water column when some marine algae cell die, then um, they tend to sink to through the, um, the water column. And these, uh, these cells are used by new marine phytoplankton to feed on and for the bloom to keep going. Um, next. I just want to finish this talk um, to open towards Eric's talk that will be next. I wanted to mention that these Australian fires in 2019-2020 did not only open research question on biogeochemistry. There's been a large number of studies related to these events, which focus on different perspectives such as human health, um, fire prevention and land use management after fires or to prevent fires. Um, the question of how to adapt to such extreme weather events has been raised, uh, both on the scientific aspects, on the practical aspects, and on the political aspects. And um, some vegetation loss and recovery, ecosystem loss and recovery studies has also emerged thanks to these, um, to these fires in a way. So these extreme weather events are not only subject for scientific discussion. In October this year, a multidisciplinary workshop will be organized by the joint group of experts on the scientific aspects of marine environmental protection, GESAMP, uh, in South Africa. This workshop will gather scientists, policymakers, and ocean users in order to discuss the broader impacts of extreme climate scenario. For example, if we take the case of fishery, um, as climate change is expected to induce shifts in the amount and location of the fish stock in the coming decades, countries and population will need to adapt and implement new and sustainable strategies for fisheries, including new regulation and new coordination between um, bordering countries that will fish on the same spot. For this reason, I believe that um, it is key for us scientists to keep discussing and sharing what we found with um, a broader community. And we also need to listen to the problematic that impacts society in order to um, adapt our research to an efficient way uh, that respond to um, the society needs. And I hope I haven't been too long. Thank you very much. Oh, lovely, Morgan. Thank you very much. Um, uh, we're going to move on to Eric's presentation. And uh, and I would just like to, since a little bit of change of subject, I would just like to add the fact that uh, all of us will have to or are already interacting with government and people in politics. And I think it's a really welcome uh, Eric's perspective to bring this because we are not exposed much to this interactions or learn that uh, about this at the university so uh, uh, but we have to we have to deal with it in our lives so uh, I look forward to hear what Eric has to say. Thank you very much Santiago and thanks very much to the organizers for inviting me to give a lecture here and last but not least also thanks to Cecile and Morgan for bringing up so many questions um, to which I could relate um, and since I'm a lawyer by training, um, there's a, always a risk of having me talking for way too long. So I'm glad that this is only 20 minutes, so I cannot cover all questions in depth, maybe not even all of them. So that's what the first slide is for, um, to focus a little bit on what I'm going to try to tell you in the next 15 to 20 minutes. So SOLAS obviously links the lower atmosphere and the surface ocean. Um, now, society is not always aware of these links. Since I'm a lawyer by training, I will focus on the, on the governance aspect. 
Um, and governance especially is a way, of course, to influence um, what the environment does, um, but we can only regulate our interactions with the environment, right? We cannot regulate the environment itself. So there are certain things I cannot do anything about as a politician, volcano eruptions being one of them, right? They are very hard to regulate. I mean, this is obvious, but this is something that we have to, um, we have to be aware of. Ship emissions, on the other hand, as also mentioned by Cecile, that is something you can regulate. What then with the problem of wildfires? Um, that depends. And this is an answer that you will hear a lawyer uh, giving very often. It depends, right? So um, I will try to touch upon some issues where you can regulate wildfires and how. Um, and But what I will mostly focus on is international aspects of regulation of the atmosphere, uh, since we are talking about atmospheric deposition here, and some aspects of ocean regulation in the end as well. And I'll try to point out as well where these interact. And the answer is most obviously not really a lot. So we have here within SOLAS thousands of scientists working on SOLAS on lower atmosphere and surface ocean interaction and government's perspective mainly say nah, we either regulate the ocean or the atmosphere. So let's see what we can do about that. Um, second, I'll go to the next one. Yeah, there we go. So this from the frame, from the picture that you saw on the first slide, right? This, um, here's the first slide again. So the right, the lower right hand corner um, is the team of today. You saw Cecile showing this already. Um, and this shows obviously also what we can regulate and what we cannot regulate. So the chimneys on the right hand side, you can regulate the volcanoes rather not, the ships, yes. And whatever happens in the ocean is also of course hard to regulate. What does society want to do about this? And what is the bigger picture, so to say, on an international level? Maybe you were aware of these 17 sustainable development goals that have been negotiated uh, in the framework of the United Nations and were adopted in 2015. Um, the ones we are looking at as the SOLAS community is mainly goal 13 on climate action and goal 14 on life below water. They have also been put in a different format and that's the following format, where you can see that this relates to the, the three classic pillars of sustainable development, where four goals, among them climate action and life below water, are seen as part of the biosphere. Then we have another eight goals that are part of society and another four goals that um, relate to economic aspects. The one connecting them all is the last goal, it's called partnerships, and that is goal 17. So here you can see already that they tried to divide this, of course, within the biosphere sustainable development goals, there are also links um, to society, obviously, right? But this is already a focus where we start um, separating natural aspects from societal aspects, which is not always very helpful. So we have departed from this also a little bit um, to separate economy, society, and biosphere. Um, the broader framework of governance is mostly seen in this way. Um, I will mostly focus on the, in the rest of this talk, mostly focus on the things on top. So global treaties and customary law, which means if states behave in a certain way, then this can also become law without having to write it down. And then there are many regional treaties in the EU, in Latin America, in Asia, or even Southeast Asia, um, North America. Um, the Europe has a lot of regulation, right, which is put on a separate level because it's also uh, binding on the EU member states in a way. But what is most important is the national legislation, because whatever you say on an international level, be it binding or non-binding, the sustainable development goals are non-binding, treaties are binding on uh, states, um, it still has to be implemented in national law. And here we come also to certain problems, right? So 
even if you then have implemented in national law. So there's a couple of steps, right? You can agree on something internationally, which we clearly need to do when we talk about SOLAS issues. Then you can implement it in the, in the national state, um, let's say in Australia, when there would be an international regulation for wildfires, right? But then how are you gonna make sure that that actually creates, human, uh, changes human behavior? changes uh, societal aspects. And this is very hard to do. So we also need to think about enforcement. And that is mainly on the national level. Because you're all from very different countries, I will focus on the international parts. So this is something most of you might be able to relate to. We love definitions, but law is most of the time reactive, right? And governance is also reactive. We, what do I mean with that? Something goes wrong and then we think, ooh, that was not a good idea. Let's react to it. So a similar thing happened in the 1970s in Europe and North America when they started reacting to long range transboundary air pollution. You don't have to read this out. I'll read it for you. Um, it's also not gendered, right? This is more than 40 years old. So pollution could only be caused by men, which is, not the case anymore that was never the case really but um they have a very broad definition so air pollution means the introduction by man directly or indirectly so if something um uh, ends up in the air through water means it's also included of substances or energy into the air direct resulting in deleterious effects of such a nature as to endanger and then we get a whole list of things human health mentioned by um, Morgan, harm living resources, fisheries, for example, ecosystems also mentioned, material property um, and impair or interfere with amenities and other legitimate uses of the environment. Air pollutants shall then be construed accordingly. I'm not gonna read more, the long range sense boundary air pollution definition then focuses on how this changes actually internationally. If you look at this, air pollution definition, you can include a lot of things on it. Um, maybe even if you want, and this is um, outrageous within my community at least, um, carbon dioxide, right? Uh, or any other uh, things we are looking at. Then, back then, we were not even thinking about these things in the 1970s. So there is a specialized law that comes actually later on. But to give you an idea what is actually regulated under this convention on long range transboundary air pollution, which focuses only on the North Atlantic, so North America on the one hand and Europe on the other hand, it's not binding in other parts of the world. They focused on um, a lot of different things and what um, I wanted to list a couple of them here. So they have a protocol under that which specifically focuses on sulfur. They have one on nitrogen oxides. They have one on heavy metals. They have one on persistent organic pollutants. And all these protocols have in the meantime also entered into force. So they are enforceable and should be translated into national laws of the states that actually signed up to this convention and these protocols. So there are things being done. The details are very technical in these protocols. So um, that's beyond my understanding. So I also don't dare to explain that to you. You probably know better what is in these protocols um, than uh, I do if you would like to read them. They are freely available on the web. Um, let me see. There we go. Um, one specific issue which was um, uh, regulated and which most of the time seen as a big success was the Vienna Convention for the Protection of the Ozone uh, Layer. And the initiation of this was mainly done um, um, by scientists as well, right? Some scientists that won the Nobel Prize um, actually for this. On the first SOLA summer school, I've heard there was one of these Nobel Prize winners actually giving a lecture. Um, so this focuses, this convention focuses mainly on the initiation of research, exchange of information. It promotes that national states would adopt certain policies, but it doesn't say how much. So there we need something extra. And what do we normally do in cases like this? We have a general convention which doesn't say much like the Vienna Convention. And then in, an in a special protocol, we're gonna do something specific. Um, oopsie. And the one protocol that is, of course, famous in the Vienna Convention um, is the Montreal Protocol, which then actually did give these targets. 
In 2017, they decided, okay, if this convention is actually working so well, it, has the mo it is the most widely international legal document there is, re ratified document, 196 or 197 parties. That's more than the United Nations has members. Um, they decided, okay, how can we actually use the success of this treaty, right? Because we were able to actually reduce holes in the ozone layer. Um, mainly also due to this regulation and the high involvement of science in this. Um, they said, why can we not do that for climate change, right? One of the reasons is that ozone layer, um, it was easier to regulate CFCs on the one hand under the ozone layer convention than regulating all climate gases um, or greenhouse gases on uh, under another treaty, right? But they have tried. And in the Kigali amendments, efforts have been made to more strictly control substances that are falling under the Montreal Protocol, so that could cause damage to the ozone layer, but are also having a negative effect on the climate. So they tried to use one particular treaty to um, focus on things that might go actually beyond what it was initially be, um, negotiated for. And that brings us, of course, to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Um, and here it mainly says that um, they divide, this is 1992, so this is just after the fall of communism, right? 30 years old now, and they divided the states that would like to sign up to this in three different categories, um, developed, developing, and transitional. The transitional ones were the ones that had, communi had a communistic system and then changed to a uh, more market-oriented system. Um, the transitional and developed states were urged to actually implement national policies to mitigate climate change with the aim to reduce their emissions of greenhouse gases to their 1990 levels. Now, this was um, in the beginning seen as um, a good idea, but it then did not give any methods of how to do this, right? Uh, developing countries had other rules applicable to them, although many of them are actually suffering the most from it, right? Here on the right-hand side, you see the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Tuvalu um, speaking to the um, uh, conference of the parties of this very convention, which meets every year, right? Last year in Glasgow, you might've heard about that in November. And he gave a digital talk and he says, if you continue like this, it was actually first focusing in on his face, right? So he had no idea what was going on. And then they zoomed out and then you saw he was actually standing in the ocean. And he said, if you don't do anything about this, we are the ones gonna suffer from this. And his example is of course, sea level rise. The framework convention on climate change uses two main ways to regulate things. Um, they go either for mitigation, so the reduction of greenhouse gases mainly, and the second tier is adaptation. So when there is something um, happening anyway, like climate change, you might as well also want to adapt to it. Then the famous Paris Agreement is an agreement that is actually hanging under this United Nations Framework uh, Convention on Climate Change. So it is an agreement adopted by the Conference of the Parties in Paris in 2015. However, it still does not say you need to do this. No, it mainly says you actually, as a nation, as a state, you need to come up with a plan what to do. Whatever is in that plan, we don't care too much about it. So it was celebrated as a big success. We have to wait what the effects are on the long term. What we actually hope for is that there is some kind of competition between states, that that will happen. So one state says, I'm in Germany now, for example, right? So Germany says, um, oh yeah, we need to do this and this and this, but we at least, whatever we do, we need to be better than France, right? So um, that might be an example of how this is, uh, gonna work. There's many things regulated in the Paris Agreement, um, and you see an overview of those things here. So they also um, uh, reconfirm, so to say, that mitigation and adaptation part of it, right? A third part is actually um, when we talk about mitigation, and this is becoming more and more important, but is not really regulated on a global level, is actually climate intervention another topic that SOLAS deals with. It has some regulatory aspects, 
also relating, for example, to ocean iron fertilization. Um, so another aspect of uh, the things that um, Morgana already mentioned in her talk, um, but it's it, not enough time to, to go into that uh, there now. Um, so this is an overview of the Paris Agreement. Now, if you remember, the, this is all mainly atmosphere, right? That doesn't say much about the ocean. The United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change has in its Article 4 only one mention of the ocean, and not even directly. It talks about sinks, and we need to enhance our sinks. That's about it. So there's, although the ocean is, well, and you know that better than I do, very important um, to mitigate climate change, has been in the past and will be in the future, it is not explicitly mentioned. And this is one of those examples where I say that clear disconnect between the atmosphere on the one hand and the ocean on the other hand. It becomes very obvious when we talk about climate change, for example. The funny thing is, however, if we now take the marine pollution definition, which also comes from the 70s, from, this is the one that I took from the Law of the Sea Convention, which is ratified by 168 parties, and so almost all states in the world, um, the introduction by man, directly or indirectly, of substances or energy into the marine environment, including estuaries, which results or is likely to result in such deleterious effect. And then the same list of things, right? So the, it's interesting to see that the definition for pollution, for air pollution and marine pollution is actually very, very similar. One big advantage of this one is that it adds in the third line or is likely to result. This means that something can account as marine pollution when it's not even sure that it will actually be a pollutant. And that sounds a little weird, but this incorporates a precautionary approach, right? If we are not even 100% sure, we can already prohibit it because it might have negative effects. Interesting thing is also that again, if you take carbon dioxide as an example, this could be a marine pollutant. So if we want to increase this ocean as a sink, which is necessary under atmosphere law, right? The United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, for example, this is forbidden under the law of the sea, where I got this from the definition from, because it's pollution. So we have a clear mismatch between those two things, which we clearly have to work on. One of the specific things, and this is because Cecile mentioned ship emissions as well, is two things we need to differentiate, right? So, and um, we have on the one hand operational pollution, which is pollution that always occurs and that is hard to actually prevent from happening. Um, and this um, is separated from Accidental pollution. And accidental pollution is always what makes it to the news, right? That's when an oil tanker breaks in two or container vessels starting to lose containers due to um, bad weather. Let's focus on operational pollution. Um, there is no way to prevent this from happening, right? A ship will have to run, so there will be somehow emissions. Um, so here the main targets are actually reduction and control of these emissions. And this is done in different ways. Um, the International Maritime Organization has a lot of um, treaties and other international instruments that contain actually technical um, rules and examples of that are not only on emissions, they create, for example, emission control areas in certain um, areas, the Baltic Sea area is an emission control area where, for example, the amount of sulfur that you can emit is um, reduced to almost zero. Um, uh, they also have other rules um, for um, phasing out of single hull oil, oil tankers, for example. This more relates to accidental pollution than again. Um, so this is something that is done in the marine environment and clearly relates then also to the atmosphere. It's one of the very few examples where you relate something under the nomer of law of the sea, so the marine environment, ship emissions, um, and it's actually uh, directly relating to the atmosphere. Krista is, for example, in a project that um, deals with um, ship emissions um, specifically, um, also looking at it from an economic and from a legal side. One of my colleagues here at the Institute is working on that too. This 
um, marine pollution is regulated generally since the 1970s, as I mentioned already, right? I took the definition from the Law of the Sea Convention, but the actual um, definition was first mentioned in this Marpol Convention. 1973 was not very successful. Nobody wanted to agree on it. So they said, okay, we need to change something. Let's do it five years later, 1978. So that's why it says 1973 and 1978. And this works in exactly the same way as that long range transboundary air pollution convention. It's a relatively short convention with, for example, that definition of marine pollution. And then we actually start to list specific things that we want to regulate. And if you look at the last annex, here they are not protocol, called protocols, but annexes. So this is a, it's more or less the same thing. Um, and the last annex is actually to prevent air pollution from ships. So this is one of those very few um, things, like I mentioned, that crosses that divide between the ocean and the atmosphere. Um, with this, I don't know how I'm doing on time, but it's um, over the top of the hour already. So um, in order to leave enough time for discussion, uh, I would leave it at this and I hope to have given you an, uh, a taste at least of what society can do through international regulation of the issues discussed within the broader SOLAS community. Thanks for listening. Okay. Hello, everybody. Um, now we move into the discussion session section. Uh, I have so many questions. I mean, I, I, I would like to take them all, but, uh, uh, but I could break the ice with that. But I would like to uh, know if anybody in the audience has uh, questions. Uh, please uh, use the handle to your little hand from the uh, uh, zoom option um, really I mean if you have any clarification questions to any of the speakers or actual uh, more in-depth questions uh, please feel free um, <laughs> uh, well I, I'll just I'll just just to get the conversation going I uh, I'll, I'll ask something to Eric just to clarifications uh, I mean what, something I mean now the issue of microplastics is is very much in vogue uh, can you comment on that how would it fit microplastics in the uh, uh, in the legislation you've been discussing yeah thanks Santiago um, so what they normally do and this is something I did not have the time to uh, to go in detail with um, they look at different kinds of um, of uh, pollution, right? And if we look at marine pollution, they divide that in vessel-based pollution, they divide that in seabed pollution, so anything that comes from uh, drilling for oil and gas, for example, uh, anything that comes through the atmosphere, so this might also include ship emissions, or emissions from land, right, that go through the atmosphere and then end up in the ocean. The, the difficulty, and this is something I didn't mention, but with wildfires is that you really have to look at what is the cost, right? The cost is on land. So it's Australia that needs to regulate this. There's nobody internationally that can say, hey, in Germany, we don't like what Australia is doing. That is not a possibility. Right? Um, so the, that is national law. Uh, and the problem is with plastics is that this is hurting directly the main um, uh, part of nation's economies namely industry, right? So the problem is there that land-based pollution, although this is the largest source of marine pollution, so everything that comes from land, so either from industry or from agricultural runoff, is not regulated on an international level. There's a global plan from the United Nations Environment Program from the 1980s, but that's a plan. That is not a treaty or something that's binding upon anyone because no state wants to regulate their own industries and if they don't want to they don't have to so um that is an um that is a big issue and that's also why it gets difficult to have really hard and binding um regulations for climate change in the first place but also similar uh, things apply to uh, to plastic pollution well thank you uh i think morgan has a comment 
Um, also a question, I, I take the advantage that you ask a question to Eric, um, because it seems so large to have international regulation. Um, how, does, how does it work as applying these rules in each and every country? Like, is there a global, um, a global body that check that everybody is making uh, the right things? Is that a duty from every country to make sure that their people respect this international regulation? How does it work? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question also, Morgan. Um, thanks for that. It's, it's mostly the states that have to do it, right? So the difference with national law, if I hit somebody in the face here in Germany, the state will say, hey, you're not allowed to do that. So the state is above me. That's what they call the monopoly on violence. On the international level, we don't have such a thing. Everybody is the same, right? So the United States has the same, theoretically, value internationally as now rule which is a little island with 10,000 inhabitants, right? So they can officially not tell each other what to do because there is, they are all equal. And it's also these states that make the rules. They should obey the rules and they should also enforce the rules. So in short, who has to do it? If we decide on something internationally, we need to make sure it trickles down to the national level, right? So it's up to the national, to the states then to implement what is ever is agreed upon on the international level. Now, lawyers always come into, um, lawyers always ask when something goes wrong, right? You never ask when something, everybody obeys the rules, you don't need lawyers. Um, so we are, then the next question is, what are you gonna do if a state is not adhering to the rules? How are you, getting, how are you putting pressure on this state? And then it depends on what has been regulated, what kind of pressure you can put on this state. And if you're a large state with a huge economy and you can force other states to say, you are not gonna comment on my human rights situation, for example, or you are not gonna comment on my economy, then this is something large states can do. Small states cannot do that. So in practice, larger states are more influential than smaller states. Now, one last aspect of what you said, an international organization. There's no such thing as a World Ocean Organization, right? Um, they decided against that. This was proposed after the Second World War, but they decided against it. And now they have divided all aspects that deal with the ocean over different organizations. So the Food and Agriculture Organization in Rome deals with fisheries. We have the... Um, International Whaling Commission in Cambridge, the United Kingdom, that deals with whaling. We have the International Maritime Organization in London that deals with shipping. We have regional seas agreements that are all managed in Nairobi, in Kenya. Um, when it comes to biodiversity, there's a secretariat of the Convention on Biological Diversity, which is in Canada. So, in, and so on and so on and so on. These are a couple of examples, and we are really dependent on, for example, what you said, Morgan, at the end about the Gazam workshop, when climate change and fisheries relate to each other, right, then we are dependent on organizations that are responsible for that, or secretariats of, treaty, um, of treaties, in order to, to talk to each other. And only then we can see what happens on the national level. So there's a whole lot of aspects. Um, the only way to do it is make international regulation attractive in a way of saying, if you do this, this is gonna help you out. If you don't do this, these are the consequences, right? So you need to make a strong case uh, to convince states to uh, obey international rules. I think, uh, let me comment on that. I think, uh, and actually what I'm gonna say, I think it, it links all the speakers today. Uh, one of the issues is uh, if, the way I see it is if you have a grassroots movement who asks for a better uh, enforcement or, uh, 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 you know, uh, yeah, promote this, this kind of legislation. But the one, I mean, there, there has to be a motivation. So, for example, if you have the fishing industry realizing that pollution is starting to impact uh, the productivity. I mean, the fish stocks are being impacted. And, and as a scientist, we are still not at that, at least as far as I know, and maybe somebody in the audience, know, as far as I know, we don't have clear indications of whether uh, atmospheric deposition of pollution is impacting uh, the economical cycle 
through fisheries. So maybe something to be found. I mean, um, but do we know? And maybe, you know, the next generation here present, maybe they can provide that link. And is, how, what, is what is the impact of atmospheric deposition in the upper trophic levels in the, in the ocean, in the ocean ecosystem? Uh, is it, does anybody know? Is, is it an open question? Or are there actual examples right now that we, one we can use of where we know, you know, dust or smoke uh, here, deposited here, and then a boat came to fish and they didn't find anything. Uh, <laughs> would be an, a great example of that. Uh, I mean, I was, I'm curious about what M Morgan mentioned, uh, I guess some working group where specifically they address, they were asking the question about impacts on fisheries. Oh, that's my phone, sorry. <laughs> uh, um, Cecile, do you want to comment on that first? Or? I, I just wanted to, re to record about the example of iron fertilization because uh, this is something that uh, the world community um, uh, tried to fight against uh, something that could be generalized instead of having some scientific uh, targeted project to show what is the actual impact of uh, such uh, uh, artificial fertilization. And uh, we had to, uh, to write, uh, um, um, how, do you, um, how do you call that, um, memorandum? No, I don't, I don't know the name. Uh, yeah. Summary for policymakers. Yes, <laughs> to say that uh, the scientific community was against uh, the use of such uh, um, process to uh, infinite uh, more uh, fishes and more uh, nutrients. And, um, but we still want to, to study that in terms of, of uh, scientific aspects. So I'm not sure uh, we, are in the, um, we have the ability to, to conduct a strong um, um, push toward um, uh, to, to get new laws uh, to, 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 to try to push in the good direction. And the, the, the workshop uh, that uh, we are going to, to participate with Morgan is really interesting in that sense because uh, having the people uh, involved from the beginning in the scientific uh, process uh, is very, uh, I think, the only way to 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 um, to be able to have um, um, an impact on the society. Because if we, after uh, doing several type of works, we say, "Oh, be, be careful! Such aerosol can be toxic for such uh, uh, phytoplankton and so on." The people won't care. They want to see something that is really the big picture of, of it. And, and this workshop with, uh, at the beginning, some people from the social science and from uh, the politics will may have an impact. If we show the people that climate change is going to, to really change the, 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 the places where the, the, the fish are, are going to, to, to be able to be catched and that's a million of people are, are going to, to, to starve if this happens really, and if this is going on obviously, uh, it will have an impact because scientists and politics are involved from the beginning. So, yeah. Yeah, I guess it comes back to what Eric said on um, making science appealing for non-scientists, like showing them that they too, um, are impacted by our research topics. So if we show them that not only our science is important for climate change, but it's, it's also important for their living expenses, for their work, for their everyday lives, then um, there's a way to, um, to interest them in a way. Yeah, I, I, think, I think in a way that, that's a, a useful development. Incidentally, right now I'm in a working group here at NASA where uh, NASA has given us money to look at some aspect of that, which is impacts of volcanic eruptions on fisheries. And uh, and I'm in this working group with you know uh, people who know a lot about fish and <laughs> and they count fish, and uh, we are just sitting and talking and. Uh, the fact that things something like this are happening and have been initiated at the government level is is suspicious, uh, but uh, it's just a demonstration also that things are going slow, too. Uh, but uh, they're happening. So Anna, you have a question? 
Um, yeah, maybe more of a comment, but I, first I want to thank you for the discussion and the presentations. They were really interesting and complimenting, I would say. But um, uh, I think also one issue that I have uh, identified, I work with shipping, marine uh, environmental effects from shipping. Um, and uh, I think there's also, it's not only a mismatch in not regulating and investigating atmospheric and marine uh, effects at the same time, it's also different endpoints. So on marine, when we look at marine environmental effects, we often look at the, uh, the uh, organisms that live there and it, maybe uh, at the end fisheries, but very rarely we come to that. It's uh, on the lower trophic levels. While on air quality, it's often human health, uh, sometimes like maybe acidification um, uh, of lakes, for example, in Sweden, where I live, that was, but that was uh, way back perhaps, but still. Uh, uh, so I think it's also like the, uh, yeah, the end points and the goal with the regulation can make them uh, tricky to formulate. So, uh, but I think it's very interesting, like you said, that we also as scientists, we need to think about, uh, it was interesting that you said that you had to like formulate a memorandum just to say that you are not, this is not for uh, the purpose of uh, promoting a strategy for fertilization. It's, uh, we want to uh, show you research results, but you have to be so aware of how you communicate research today. So I don't know if you have any comments on that as well. Eric, maybe? <laughs> yeah, I can always comment. That's also. Uh, <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, to a couple of comments, and then I also try to include uh, Anna's comment. Um, these examples that we were given from iron fertilization um, is, is an example where the precautionary approach was taken to the extreme, right? So, the international regulation now more or less says. Um, we should not fertilize the oceans with iron, except for small scale research um, uh, experiments. The question is, however, if small scale research experiments would lead us anywhere. Um, and um, this is also the only part that is now regulated on an international level. Uh, other parts of geoengineering or climate intervention have not been regulated yet. Um, and under international law in general, what is not forbidden is allowed. Right, so you could go ahead with other things, unless it counts as pollution. Right, for example, that would be a, that would then be an issue. Um, and this this fertilization problem is mainly societally a big issue. When I talk to NGOs, and um, then they say, "Yeah, but if you make climate intervention a possibility, that means that people can emit more greenhouse gases." No, we need both. Right, I think it's clear that the IPCC now in all its calculations actually includes negative emissions. So uh, we need both. And this is something that we communicate to society. On the other hand, um, um, we also need to communicate to policymakers. But I like the points that were made were also by, um, by Santiago, but that grassroots movement, right? Because it's not only the states, as I answered to Morgan, that need to implement it. It's also the states that make the rules. And who is the state? That's you and I, right? So we need to influence, I don't know how you do it, Fridays for Future or how is it called, these kind of things or other kind of movements, and then you can influence it. Um, or as scientists as such, right? Which was happen which was a big part of the ozone layer um, the convention that mainly came from the scientific uh, community. And um, the, the, the thing, then is, and this is my answer to Anna's, uh, Anna's question, I think, um, international regulation is very siloed. So we don't tend to look at more than one example. We are going to, what are we going to do? Regulate ozone layer, regulate climate change, regulate fisheries, regulate human health. The connections between there are hardly visible. I mentioned the Kigali amendments in my presentation. That is one of those rare examples where you take the ozone layer convention to regulate climate change, which is actually regulated by another convention, namely the 
framework convention on climate change. Those are, those are rare things. So I think what you, if I understood correctly, uh, Anna, what you pointed at is that we also don't necessarily look at these, um, these connections. And this is a very tough thing to do with climate and fisheries. It's coming up slowly um, more and more, but human health, for example, is regulated then by the World Health Organization. They don't even talk to the people from that do something with, um, that regulate air pollution, right? We had last year, I think, the first national case where in a London court, the judge actually said this girl that was 10 years old and died of respiratory problems, we call it respiratory problems, right? Was actually a cause of air pollution. And therefore, and then we come into liability questions, which is a whole other thing. Um, this was the first time. There's hundreds, thousands of people dying of air pollution every year, but nobody talks about that. We call that respiratory problems, right? So it's really where do you look at where what are you gonna what are you gonna regulate and uh, what are the consequences? I am fully aware that I talk too long and ask more questions than give answers, but um, there's so much to say about society stuff. I mean, there there is a perspective too that uh, that it relates to how the timescales of how these phenomena occur and how that relates to the human scale or human lifetime. Uh, you know, climate change has been happening for the last 20 years, but because we focus on the uh, season change from one year to the year, we just don't seem to grasp the gravity of it. Uh, and and same way with the, some of the phenomena we are looking into, I mean, the uh, errors of the position. And Cecile showed good examples of what you just dump dust and there is something happens one way or another, but it's, it's very immediate in this. But at the same time, we are talking about impacts of uh, aerosol deposition at scales of uh, centuries. Like we're talking about fluctuations of CO2 that we find in ice cores that it seems to be associated with dust deposition. Uh, so that's when we talk about those uh, phenomena that we even in our own community, we are still grasping with the time scale that it operates. I mean, and like, you know, it could be a few days, it could be centuries. And as long as we are still debating on how to this works, we, we cannot agree on, well, this is going to happen in this time frame, and this is going to impact, impact well, not necessarily you, but it will be your children. We are, we are, we are still not being able to articulate that because, well, we haven't done the findings that to do that. Uh, so I, th I think what I'm trying to point out is that we, we as scientists, we are still trying to define how these phenomena operate and, uh, and even to define the very basic things as they relate to human scale are still uh, TBD. Um, but again, at the same time, it helps to be conscious of that and articulate that when we talk to decision makers. That's uh, that it's it's an observation. I guess that that's what I wanted to illustrate. Um, so, anyways, so any any other comment question? <laughs> yeah, Lee, I think I saw Lisa first. So go ahead. I just, <clears throat> excuse me, the first thing I've said this morning, my apologies. <laughs> um, I have some, something, I think this is probably a question for all three of you. Uh, you might, any of you might have some insights or thoughts about this. I've been running across, um, it seems more and more research lately, um, talking about how a lot of, um, Anthropogenic atmospheric pollution, particularly urban and industrial pollution, can have both um, a fertilizing and a polluting impact. And I'm wondering um, what thoughts any of you might have on that um, from, from both scientific and regulatory uh, perspectives. <clears throat> So I, I can answer, I, I didn't develop at all. I just show that uh, nitrate can also be attached to dust uh, when the particles are, are mixing uh, uh, with several chemical species in the atmosphere. And, and actually this is quite positive because it will bring a necessary nutrient. So if you don't have this mixing, if you 
uh, only have the dust. Uh, we, we did this kind of experiment, what we call the, the transported dust that we can mimic in the laboratory. We had um, uh, different uh, chemical components and we end up with uh, having a nice cocktail of nutrients. But at the same time, um, in the map where I showed the response in terms of chlorophyll, uh, I didn't uh, detail that, but we, we have cases where we have a negative answer when we add aerosols. And this is due to um, metals like copper that can be uh, toxic at one point uh, to the certain uh, small um, phytoplankton species. So uh, again, this is not uh, um, a, a single uh, case uh, possible. We, we have different type of mixing. Some metals are toxic, some are um, beneficial for the ongoing limitation. And uh, yes, uh, anthropogenic um, nitrogen can help to fertilize some part of, uh, of the ocean, that's true. Maybe Morgan, you can also comment on that about your experiments and... Well, just uh, on the nitrogen fertilization, uh, one thing that is tricky is that there's still a large uncertainty on what part of the ocean are limited by what elements or what combination of elements. So when we investigate the composition of the atmosphere, we don't quite know what's missing in, in the surface ocean. And so it's hard to say, yes, it's this element that created this bloom or, yeah. So there's still un uncertainties um, in both sides above and under the ocean. But what we measured um, on our fire impacted aerosols, so fire emissions, is that um, the nitrate and ammonium composition or content in the fire plume increased as the plume was transported over the, the open ocean anywhere. And, and so these nitrates can be uh, or can relieve um, ecosystem limitation if it ends up in the right spot where um, nitrate is uh, needed in the ocean. So um, yeah, we know that all these elements are in fire emissions. Then the question is what is missing in seawater to understand what's the impact of fire emissions on, on the surface ocean. So we really need to, it's, it comes back to this question Hannah raised on um, communication between the two worlds, atmosphere, ocean, scientists, um, keeps communicating on what you need to know in the ocean or what we need to know in the atmosphere and how this match at a certain location, um, because it's, it's very dependent on what location you're studying. So yeah. I could imagine it would also be somewhat dependent on the um, lability or the concentrations of materials in the material. Um, uh, a lot of a lot of things are nutrients at small concentrations and poisons at high concentrations, right? Yeah, usually yeah. The, the metals will be in quite low concentration. So when we talk about the copper toxicity, it was uh, demonstrated with uh, experimental evidence that uh, even uh, low concentration of copper in, in dust particles that have been mixed with anthropogenic particles can have a toxic effect. Um, nitrogen, um, actually, because this uh, is uh, usually coming from nitric acid in, in the atmosphere, it will um, just uh, absorb on the particles that like act as uh, small sponges, let's say. And when you release that particle, those particles in seawater, it will uh, definitely release everything from, uh, from concerning nitrogen. So 100% of nitrogen absorbed will be released in, in seawater. So, so could it that can lead be, to a eutrophication problem in some places? It, it can be what? Sorry. Could that lead to a eutrophication problem no, no, in some no, places? No, no, no. Not in the open ocean, but no. No, no. okay, no. never mind. Yeah. Well, I don't know about the coastal area because the coastal area can be impacted by a very uh, high concentration in aerosols, but usually it comes along with very high concentration in the, in the rivers or whatever uh, local emissions so uh, we are, i'm not working on, on too much on coastal uh, ecosystems so i don't know but uh, i think for example the the the, the fire uh, in in australia uh, it travels so much in the atmosphere that of course uh, the particles were enriched from the beginning with uh, lithogenic uh, particles and biomass um, uh, content 
but then of course the, the particle as soon as they they travel they will get uh, more and more uh, chemical species so that's a very interesting um, uh, question that is quite difficult to modelize uh, to actually so yeah another question for you Eric <laughs> if you want more. <laughs> yeah um yeah so my reaction to it would be, and I'm not sure if I completely got what you meant, Lisa, so please interrupt when I didn't understand it um, uh, or understood it wrongly. But the, with these kind of, with many of these kind of processes, it's the first, can we regulate it, right? Is it a natural process that we cannot really regulate? And then where start we do, doing this? So when Cecile approached me a couple of months ago and said, what are the societal issues or the regulatory issues with, with these fires, for example, then the, the first thing that came to my mind, well, it, it depends how the fire started, right? If you look at the cause of the fire, um, a lawyer will always say, okay, but who lit the fire? And then um, if the fire was not lit, but just by the sun, if the sun lit the fire, yeah, then there's not much we can do about it. We cannot punish the sun for it. Right. So this, although these same fires might have, or these fires might have the same result, if we look at the causes, that is where regulation could start. Um, if we then look at, which is normally, um, if we talk about the carrot and the stick, right, the stick is always liability issue. So who's going to pay for it? Um, and then you need to be able to point to someone. And now with this science, apparently you can really trace, okay, what this fire actually caused um, is um, um, related, is directly relatable to what we are talking about. For And I fall back on that example, for ozone, it's easy, right? It was CFCs that caused mostly ozone layer uh, depletion. For climate change, it's a whole lot of different things. And that is also the result that the problem now with uh, international but also national court cases about this. Um, there's a Peruvian farmer that has a case in Germany now because Germany um, is the basis of the largest European uh, energy conglomerate, RAA it's called, and RAA is responsible for 0.5% of all carbon dioxide emissions and the Peruvian farmer says the glacier in my backyard is threatening my existence, so I go to port in, in, in Germany. Um, the main questions about this is, um, can the melting glacier be related to whatever the German energy company caused, right? And this is something also a role for the scientists. And if I understood Morgan well, you can clearly trace, okay, this comes from this fire, right? Or this comes, this is at least significant. That is an advantage over what we are talking generally in climate change, where we cannot really always trace that this carbon dioxide molecule is at least is indeed uh, coming from this and this uh, company. So those are a couple of the regulatory issues that then come into play. Thank you all. I. I have a I have a comment on, on basic word. It's, it's, it's something that is still hanging in my in my head from the discussion about shipping lanes. Has there been any confirmation or non-confirmation of ecosystem level impacts in regions associated associated with shipping lanes? I mean, like you know, uh, yeah, where well, we all know where they are. Uh, has there been any observation or studies sh showing? Uh, I mean, I mean, I always assume it's because it has not been reported. It's because it doesn't happen, but it's maybe it has ne never, nobody has ever looked at that. But uh, but that would be an obvious place to look into. I mean, is you know productivity different in places near shipping lanes than others? Uh, anybody is aware of such thing? I'm not aware of large scale evidence of impact on the ecosystem, but uh, some people did uh, aerosol addition with uh, what they call anthropogenic uh, aerosol from uh, exhaust of, of uh, that type. And uh, of course, it depends on, on the, as I said, on the initial composition of the 
of the natural assemblage, but of course you, you bring a nitrogen uh, to, to a, a system that may be naturally limited. So in some cases you can have a, a response, but I don't know any, uh, maybe Anna, you have some input for that, but I don't know any um, large scale um, uh, exercise, modeling exercise showing uh, how it can bring uh, specifically from the shipping emissions, uh, uh, some ecosystem response. There is an impact on pH. Um, there is a, but uh, this is only regarding the, the the aerosols themselves, not the impact on the biota at the large scale. Maybe I, I don't have the, the information. I don't know more than if you know paper about the large scale impact of shipping on the ecosystem, but not uh, aware. Yeah, Anna, Anna made a comment on the chat, but it looks like she's having sound problems but yeah she mentioned that there is ongoing uh, studies uh but maybe she yeah. oh she's back on uh uh maybe she can say something uh but anyways it sounds like a nice thesis project yeah, <laughs> yeah sorry we have uh two meetings here <laughs> no it's okay i can uh no it's okay um there is some ongoing work uh, or a lot of ongoing work with uh, looking at the effects from uh, ship emissions, both to atmosphere and uh, in the shipping lanes. So uh, ballast water or cooling water and uh, um, scrubber water that I work with. Uh, but it's really hard to do large scale experiments in the actual shipping lane because you always have ships there. <laughs> Uh, and you're not allowed to conflict with the, their space, so to say. So, uh, yeah, at the moment, it's uh, some misocost studies are done. Uh, and also within this uh, EU project that I mean, called Emerge. Uh, and then there's also laboratory work on the actual effects. But it's, uh, yeah, it's hard to uh, get uh, into the actual ship lanes and do measurements there right 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 but who's who's uh, who are leading these efforts uh, where, where are they based with what countries or what so uh, the emerge project is a, a horizon 2020 project uh, so we have collaborators uh, here in sweden uh, in finland greece uh, uk um, portugal Italy, yeah, so it's all over Europe, basically, and then uh, not all over, but we also have collaborators in other countries uh, working with some of these issues. So, and the okay. unit that I'm in are looking into several ship-related emissions. So if you ha are interested in that, please contact me more. Okay, no, good to Happy know. to talk about that. Yeah, 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 you know. But I mean, the, the good thing is that it's being, it's being uh, looked into and uh, hopefully there will be some results in a mm -hmm. yeah. short time. Yeah, yeah, okay. And that is actually something which is a positive side of, of the, the regulation. I know I was a little negative in the past, but the, <laughs> um, the International Maritime Organization is a fairly well working organization and has the options then to react to these kind of things, right? So if you say, um, okay, this shipping lane is actually hurting the environment, just a very general comment, then the IMO can say, we then move the shipping lanes. This has been done in the past in Norway, for example, um, every state has to allow innocent passage of any kind of vessel. That's a rule, a hundred, the, the, the century old rule in, in international law. Um, it can, however, apply. Norway said, too close to the coast, we don't want it, we want it further out. And then the IMO said, yes. Um, and the IMO has also its own way of um, protecting marine areas. So what their marine protected areas are called particularly sensitive sea areas. And those PSSAs are all over the place. And actually, um, so that is something where science flows in and then um, a, a good thing. But the IMO is relatively powerful. Well, that's that. I mean, that's good to know. Yeah. Uh... I just want to comment on the particularly sensitive sea areas that they are not necessarily protected. They have a stamp <laughs> that is said that they should perhaps be protected or, uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, but it's not a 
uh, necessarily protection. Like it's, yeah, they're not protected necessarily. No, Sorry. I know what you mean. So yeah. completely agree, right? If you talk about a marine protected area, always ask what is actually protected. And in most cases, nothing is protected, right? So it is uh, the vast majority of MPAs, you can still go fishing. So I completely agree, <laughs> Anna. Yes, that is um, uh, true. <laughs> Uh, what about Manuela? She has a comment. Yes, uh, great discussion. So I'm learning a lot. And I just have a spontaneous question to Eric, um, who mentioned that the IMO is a powerful organization. And I wanted to ask, maybe I've missed it, who exactly is the IMO? Can you maybe uh, say this again? Who are the people who are uh, involved there? How does it come together? So the IMO work, but, uh, thanks Manuela for the question. The, the IMO works like almost any other international organization. So there's a couple of states getting together and say, we need to solve this problem on an international level. How are we going to do it? Best probably to create an international body and for shipping that has been the International Maritime Organization. Um, didn't that start out so well until the 60s, it was called the International Maritime consultative organization. So only <laughs> uh, whatever you say we take into account, but we don't do anything. But it seems to be um, working well. So it's states in the end that decide, but there's many committees within the IMO that focus on marine pollution, marine protection, shipping lanes, and so on and so on, um, that then can decide a lot of things. And um, the advantage of the IMO, why it works relatively well, is states listen, right? So to the, that is one example of Morgan's question, who is going to do it in the end? Well, states listen to what is agreed upon in the IMO because it's an expert organization to a certain extent as well. Um, and of course, this is the negative reason, out of mind, out of, out of sight, out of mind, right? All those container vessels on the ocean, who cares about it? It's easy to regulate. So um, that is another aspect. And one particular thing which is unique to the IMO, normally if states want to have an international treaty applicable to them, they explicitly need to sign up to that. If they don't, they are not bound to that. The IMO has an alternative to say that takes too long. We need to react quicker. If you don't react in a certain time period, we take that as um, acceptance of a certain treaty. And that is working really well. So that is um, um, something that is unique in international law, but makes it very effective. And if my boss or I have to explain that the IMO takes years before it adopts regulations, we go like, but that's super fast, right? Um, where the rest of the, uh, mostly scientists are fast, really. So uh, the IMO, I have to emphasize it's relative, right? Relative to what you can achieve in other areas. Um, it's still not super fast um, when it comes to other uh, time scales. Okay, thank you. Hey, uh, we, are, we are reaching the end of the session and uh, we need some personal time before the next session. So uh, I would like to thank everybody. Uh, this was very informative and I hope it was the same for everybody else. Uh, I guess we re reconvene in, uh, you know, 13, 12 minutes by the top of the hour. And then uh, see you then. I look forward to the next session. See you. So how do we uh, how do we operate now? We just to say here's Natasha and Anna. Yeah, we've got an here's introduction slide. But I can go <laughs> ahead and introduce us and 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 share our schedule, and then um, Jamie is going to get us started on uh, on open science. So if I can go ahead and keep sharing your screen, if you will stop sharing, perfect. And I'm just going to share mine really quickly. Okay, so let's let's see. Uh, we have 36 people right now. Uh, 
is that the number we expect? We had like 40 something for the main session. I mean, I would have expected a few more. I, I think maybe give it, give it a second. Okay. I can't see your screen yet, Natasha. Okay, oh, now I can. Oh, you can or cannot? Now I can, yes. Okay, great, 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 okay. Sorry. And for some reason, my slide is not, uh, perfect, there we go. All right, so here we go. So welcome to PLUS. PLUS is the Public Library of Science. For those of you who don't know, we are a nonprofit open access journal. Um, PLUS was started um, about 20 years ago. It was founded by some researchers from Stanford and Berkeley, UC Berkeley and UC San, uh, San Francisco, including Nobel laureate Harold Barmus. And they wanted to change the way we think about science and accessing science and making that more equitable. And so PLUS has evolved over the years. And we're gonna talk to you today about open science, about diversity, equity, inclusion in science. And I'm just gonna introduce the three of us right now so I'm Natasha McDonald. Um, I, my background was in oceanography. My PhD focused on marine biogeochemistry. Um, we have Dr. Hannah Landenmark and she, her PhD focused in, and I'm going to probably get this wrong, but um, astrobiology and, and geobiology. And Dr. Jamie Mails is from Plus Climate, which is one of our newer journals. And um, his PhD was in plant sciences. And so we all, we all were researchers and, and now we're, we've crossed to the other side and we're, we're editors. And so we're also going to talk to you about um, writing and reviewing manuscripts. So here's a little overview of our schedule today. Um, each of the sessions is going to have a format where we have kind of a lecture-based plenary where we're all together. We're, we're giving you some basic information via slides, and then we're going to have a breakout session, and that's where you guys all get to talk. Um, and we will, it'll be a moderated discussion, so we will have some questions for you. We will really value your input. Um, and of course, you can post in the chat if you're feeling really shy, but we're hoping everyone feels very brave today and really wants to discuss these important topics. So we have session one is going to be open science and the importance of diversity, equity, and inclusion in science and scientific publishing. Then we're going to talk about writing and submitting your manuscript. That is something that we feel was a black box for us when we were doing our PhDs and we wish we had have had some of the tips that we know now. And then we're gonna talk about um, some of you who are in your early career um, stage of your, of your research are getting to the point where you're being invited to review manuscripts. But even if you're not, you are getting reviews on the papers you're submitting and how to interpret those comments, how to know how to respond to them so that you, know, you get your paper accepted. Um, these are something that we can provide some valuable information. And then we're gonna finish up with a big group discussion where any of your unanswered questions um, can be posed to us and, and we will try our best. Um, so with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to let Jamie take over for the first plenary lecture on open science. Thanks very much, Natasha. So I will now uh, attempt to share my screen. I have a few slides to work through. So, okay, uh, there we go. Okay, so if someone could give me a thumbs up to confirm that you can see some slides. Thanks, Anna. Great. Okay, so um, yeah, thank you very much for the introduction, Natasha, um, and thanks everyone for coming along today. It's a pleasure to be with you and to be able to start um, some really interesting, hopefully, conversations around open science and equity in publishing. Um, these are the themes of, of my initial talk, um, and which we'll then be discussing in the first of the breakout sessions. Um, and so I'm going to start off by focusing on open science and then hopefully move fairly seamlessly through into some considerations around equity in both research and publishing um, as kind of two halves of, of one ecosystem, if you like. So let's kick off with open science. Um, and open science, I guess, is um, something with many faces. Those of you who are familiar with PLOS will know that we came into being in the early days of uh, the kind of grassroots movement towards the idea of open access publishing um, in North America and Europe in the early 2000s. And I'm not going to say too much about open access per se, because I'm sure that many of you will be quite familiar with the, the concepts and the benefits of open access. But I thought it might be useful to broaden our perspective and consider how open access fits into a wider paradigm of open science. 
And open science is one of those slightly slippery terms that probably means different things to different people, depending on their background and their interests. Um, but I think it's best seen perhaps as a philosophy of transparency that extends right the way through the research and publishing process. Um, and it aims to maximize the availability, the accessibility and the usability of materials and artifacts that are generated at each stage in that process. So beyond the publication of research articles on open access platforms, there's a huge ecosystem of open science components. One open science practice that's, I think, increasingly widely adopted across disciplines and fields is comprehensive data sharing. And um, as you'll probably be aware, many research funders and publishers like PLOS have very strong policies mandating the sharing of data underlying the results that are presented in research articles or generated through projects funded by those funders. Um, and I think we can expect to see moves towards requiring or at least encouraging the sharing of code in a very similar way. Another form of open science transparency is what's called pre-registration, in which a plan for a study is published and potentially also peer reviewed prior to its being executed. And there are many benefits to this approach, including receiving early feedback on your experimental design, um, potentially increasing the reproducibility of that design and ensuring that we have a more complete scientific record um, in the literature. And pre-registration has been widely adopted in certain disciplines, um, so psychology springs to mind, um, but it is gaining ground elsewhere. Um, and PLOS has been working quite hard to promote pre-registration, um, in including by introducing new dedicated article types on some of our journals, including PLOS One, um, as well as providing a home for um, other types of outputs like peer-reviewed protocols. And another practice that PLOS has been a vocal supporter of over recent years is the use of preprints. Um, and there are many, many benefits to preprinting. Um, I won't have time to cover them all, but they include things like getting earlier and wider feedback on your work, the ability to share findings quickly, and the possibility of then updating um, that preprint manuscript over time as you work on it in response to feedback. And there are many preprint servers out there. Some of them are dedicated to specific disciplines. Some have more of a geographical focus. Um, and some are run by specific individual publishers um, in concert with their journals. And PLOS has partnerships with several large preprint servers, which enable authors to transfer preprinted manuscripts from the preprint server to a PLOS journal for peer review, or alternatively in the opposite direction so that you can submit a manuscript to the journal and then have it transferred to the preprint server for immediate posting so that it becomes publicly visible without any delay. You don't have to wait for the peer review process before sharing that paper with the community. And one final dimension of open science that I thought I'd mention now is transparent peer review in which reviewer and editor comments are shared publicly alongside research articles. And the idea is that this opening up of peer review allows readers to see the quality of the vetting process. Um, it increases the accountability of everybody involved because their comments are going to be read um, by um, people out there in the, the wide world. Um, and it also serves as a means of crediting the contribution of, of individual reviewers to the publishing process. Um, and so given all of those benefits, over the last three years, PLOS has offered authors the possibility of having their articles peer review history published on an opt-in basis. And actually just this week, we've um, shared an update on the official PLOS blog on how that initiative has been going. And the data included in that blog post um, show that we've seen an overall opt-in rate across all PLOS authors of about 40%, um, which I think is a really encouraging level of uptake, um, given the, the huge range of disciplines covered in our journals. And um, it points to some interesting patterns across those different subject areas and across our portfolio, portfolio of journals. Um, so I'd encourage you to go and take a look at that blog if you'd like to read more about those insights. Now, having said so much about all those advantages of open science, I think um, we need to maybe step, step back for a moment and recognize that actually adopting open science practices isn't always necessarily easy. Um, there are many barriers to adoption, which can fall into some of the categories shown here. Um, very often there are technical barriers, for instance, um, if you're working with a very large and complex climate model, um, finding a way to share vast quantities of underlying data can be extremely challenging with um, the limitations of existing, existing data sharing infrastructure. There are also potentially financial barriers because it takes money and time to prepare materials to share with the community. And unfortunately, support for that isn't always written into grants or provided through institutional infrastructure. Um, depending on the type of research in question, there might also be legal or commercial restrictions on how data or materials can be shared or used. 
Um, and so much of the research and publishing ecosystem is also about people and about culture. And one of the main types of barriers to embracing the potential of open science is cultural. Many scientists have been trained in cultures that instill a sense of protectiveness over their research and their data, and they might fear that moving towards open science will equate to a loss of control over um, what they're producing. And as with any cultural change, it of course takes time for conversations around those issues to really make meaningful headway in practice. Finally, and related to those cultural considerations, there are also broader systemic barriers, including the way that researchers and institutions are assessed and evaluated. And many existing evaluation systems exert quite considerable pressures on researchers to demonstrate subjective impact, um, often quantified using really questionable and problematic metrics like journal impact factor. And given the implications that there can be for researchers' career trajectories, the pressure to conform with those systemic norms can very often override researchers' preferences and principles and prevent them from engaging with open science as deeply as they might like to. And so sticking with the theme of challenges faced by individual researchers, um, I'd like to move on now to comment on some aspects of the um, accessibility of, of scientific publishing. And if we focus on climate research in particular, which is obviously the, um, the scope of the journal that I now work on, um, we can get an indication of the state of affairs by turning to a couple of publications that came out last year. First, an analysis carried out by a correspondent of the Carbon Brief, um, which is a really excellent source of information about what's happening in the world of climate. Um, and that analysis found that of the authors of 100 highly cited climate research papers, less than 1% were based in Africa, and almost three quarters were affiliated with European and North American institutions. There's a clear dominance of the landscape um, by researchers in those particular geographical regions. And then meanwhile, uh, 2021, hot list of the world's top 100 climate scientists um, drawn up by Reuters was again completely dominated in fact by white men from the global north um, prompting a huge amount of criticism and debates um, including a really fantastic editorial in the journal Climate and Development um, which I encourage you to go and read um, shown in that screenshot on the bottom right there. And it's pretty clear, I think, from these two sources alone, um, that the climate science community and the climate publishing landscape has a big problem with a lack of diversity and underrepresentation of global regions and communities, including, I would point out, um, those at most immediate risk from the impacts of climate change. And there's a huge amount of work that needs to be done to redress these imbalances, the starting point for which is to get everybody involved in the system, whether they're a researcher, a journal editor, um, or in some other role, to consciously recognise these problems and to identify actions they can take to help to build a more equitable alternative. Right, so if an author from an underrepresented background does actually get to the point of entering the system, so to speak, by submitting a paper to a quote unquote international journal, the chances are that the smooth passage of that paper through peer review may well be hindered by a whole range of biases that can surface at various stages of the peer review and publishing process. Very often, journals published by Global North publishing houses that describe themselves as global or international actually suffer from quite a severe lack of diversity in their internal staffing and vitally in the composition of the editorial board. And if you have a homogeneous pool of editors, they're very likely to have a correspondingly homogeneous set of expectations and attitudes that will consciously or unconsciously um, tend to reject the outsider and the alternative perspectives that they can bring to the table. And so this group is likely also to carry with them some quite deeply held perceptions of what constitutes scientific merit and utility and won't necessarily be aware of the potential applications of research in contexts with which they don't have familiarity. And perhaps the biggest challenge, um, I think, relates to squaring different knowledge systems. How does an editor or reviewer raised in one scientific tradition interpret and respond to knowledge generated within quite another different tradition? And how far can a journal's publication criteria flex to accommodate alternative knowledge systems? And they're not easy questions, and I definitely don't claim to have the answers, but I think the fact that we're seeing these kinds of questions raised and discussed, uh, discussed in different forums more and more often is definitely a positive sign. 
But the peer review and publishing process isn't the only arena in which biases and inequities can play out. So let's move on um, to think briefly about some of the ways in which they come into play in the way that research projects are designed and executed. And many of you would have heard of the concept of parachute or helicopter research, um, terms which are used to refer to a range of practices involving exploitation of resources and knowledge, typically in the global south and typically by researchers from the global north. Sometimes this manifests as the extraction of samples, which might be biological, clinical, or geological, or even statistical. And other times it involves interventions in natural human systems in those countries. And very often the Global North researchers carrying out studies in low income countries fail to seek local ethical or legal approval for their projects. They might fail to consult with local stakeholders or fail to recognize how local knowledge and knowledge systems could contribute to the research. And parachute research occurs across all disciplines. Um, I certainly encountered it myself when I was active in ecological research in Latin America and in the Caribbean, but it's equally pervasive in the world of climate research. And it's not just a widespread practice, it's a widespread problem. It props up paternalistic neo-colonial power dynamics. It leads to the segregation and exclusion of local and indigenous knowledges, and it holds back scientific and societal progress for everyone. It's a systemic problem and everyone involved in the research ecosystem has a part to play in tackling it. And I point to a nice publication from the Stockholm Environment Institute on shifting power through climate research, which has some really nice suggestions of positive steps that individual researchers can take. And publishers like PLOS also have a role to play. Um, and so that's why last September, we introduced a new policy across our portfolio of journals, which was designed to in increase transparency and um, in the reporting of research conducted across countries and different communities, and also to stimulate reflection and conversation um, about co-creative study design. And it's just a first step. Um, publications are only one part of the problem, but I have heard in recent conversations that other publishers are interested in introducing similar policies. And so hopefully our collective action will synergize with steps being taken by other stakeholders, including funders, institutions, and individual researchers. And together we'll be able to achieve some more systemic change. And um, on the, the theme of systemic change, um, what other actions can we take to reshape the way that research and, and publishing operates to start breaking down some of the inequities that we've discussed? Well, one type of barrier to participation that we briefly mentioned earlier was financial. And no matter how transparent and generous a waiver scheme a Global North publisher might offer, the perception reality of high article processing charges or APCs for open access publication do act as a powerful deterrent to participation by Global South scholars. And that's one of the reasons why over the past few years, PLOS has been steadily moving away from APC-based open access publishing and instead developing new financial models for its journals, which are designed to offer more equitable routes to participation. So just to give one example, PLOS Climate uses what we've termed our global equity model. And under this model, university libraries enter into a partnership with PLOS such that any authors affiliated to that institution can publish in the participating journal at no direct cost to the author. And the pricing tiers for those partnerships are transparently laid out on PLOS's website um, and they are designed to, to reflect countries world, lending, uh, world bank lending class. So in other words, a university based in a high income country will pay more to partner with PLOS the university in a low income country. And we also encourage those high income country institutions to top up their payment on an optional basis and to further subsidize participation to low income country institutions. It's still early days, but we've seen lots of enthusiasm for this, um, particularly among librarians around the world. And we finalised many partnerships and we have lots more under negotiation. And I've only spoken here about open access publishing. We don't really have time to go to the world of non-open access publishing and the practices of commercial and for-profit publishers. But suffice to say that the negotiations between those publishers and institutional libraries are um, shrouded in many layers of legally enforceable murkiness. Um, another action that can and should be taken by publishers, funders, institutions and other stakeholders in high income settings is I think to invest in capacity building in research, peer review and science communication in less well resourced countries and communities. But crucially, really crucially, the nature and content of that capacity building shouldn't be dictated by global north preconceptions. It needs to be in response to priorities laid out by those whom it's intended to benefit. So just to give one example of some of the work that PLOS has been doing in this area, just next week, I'm going to be helping to run a peer review workshop for early career researchers based on the continent of Africa. 
at the Sustainability um, Research and Innovation Congress, SRI, which is taking place in Pretoria, although sadly I'll just be joining virtually from this room in Cambridge. Um, and PLOS is organising this session with our long-term partner organisation, the African-based Training Centre and Communication, or TCC Africa. And we've been really tailoring the content of that workshop according to the insights that they've been able to share about what's actually going to be of most benefit to that regional audience. And finally, um, one last example of a cultural change that I think we can make together is to fully recognise and value regional solutions to problems in research and publishing that have historically been looked down upon by the Global North scientific establishment. So, for example, in Latin America, there is a very long and strong tradition of open access publication, totally independent from and predating the Global North open access movement of the past two decades. And an important component of that Latin American open access infrastructure is a wealth of local journals, often publishing content in local languages. And for certain types of research output, that model of dissemination has been extremely popular and successful in supporting problem solving and decision making in the regional context. And to, re to return to a word that I used earlier, there's been a neo-colonial assumption by many in the global north that we know best and that our version of scientific publication, open access or otherwise, is the optimal solution for all global regions. And of course, we don't just want to export a conceptual model, we want to be the ones offering the service too. And so I'm quite proud that over recent years, PLOS has been demonstrating how Global North publishers can behave a bit differently and take a much more nuanced approach to engagement with communities across global regions. So as part of this, um, we're actually beginning to shift our identity from being a Global North publisher, that phrase that I've been repeatedly using, to being more of a truly global publisher as we start to increase regional representation in the very fabric of our teams. So currently we're in the process of establishing an on the ground presence in locations including Kenya, Singapore and elsewhere. And the people who will be working with us from those locations won't be staff who've been dispatched from our European or North American offices. They'll actually be local experts whose values and experiences will feed directly into PLOS's evolution as an organisation. So I think that's a nice example of um, a way in which we can begin to shift uh, the very kind of fundamentals um, of, our, of our own organisations um, to, to really kind of move the needle, um, move the dial um, on equity in research and publishing. Right, I'm going to stop speaking there because I think I've probably <laughs> shared enough food for thought for now. Um, and I think the next step is for us to start um, moving into breakout rooms. So I'll stop sharing my screen. Great. So I think Paul is going to break us out into three even breakout groups or as even as possible with one of myself, Hannah and Jamie in each group. And we are going to do some facilitated discussion following up on, on Jamie's presentation. So I think we're ready to start again. Um, and uh, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. So we're going to talk about reviewing this time. And let me just get here really quickly. All right. So this is going to be about peer review. And um, for those of you who have not started peer reviewing papers yet, don't worry. This is also about how to deal with your paper being peer reviewed and how to interpret that. So a quick history of, um, of peer review is that um, the history of peer review is relatively short. So up until essentially the, the you know, the mid 20th century, um, external reviewers were not really a thing. So it was the editor in chief, um, you know, or internal reviewers um, who were assessing scientific research. And um, you can go ahead and imagine some of the problems with, with that, that may have arisen from that and the limitations in that. And, and a, a funny anecdote that, um, that Hannah likes to put forth is that Einstein notoriously um, submitted a paper to physical review and they sent it off uncharacteristically. They sent it off to an external anonymous reviewer and the editor, you know, said we would be glad to have, you know, Einstein, your reaction to these various comments and criticisms. And Einstein um, was not pleased. Uh, you know, this was not par for the course. And he could not believe that they had sent off his manuscript to some anonymous reviewer who, um, you know, had some comments uh, that he viewed deemed uh, erroneous. And uh, he pulled the paper from consideration. And so this is obviously um, changed qu quite a lot where, where even Nobel laureates and, and well-established senior researchers, they still have to go through peer review and it um, through, you know, um, 
from external reviewers. So one of the things we want to think about is the role of the reviewer. Um, and uh, basically, so some of the things are somewhat out of your control, right? So for whom and when and what you get asked to review, that's, that's somewhat out of your control, though I will say you um, should feel free to contact a journal. Some journals even have uh, options on their website to register as a reviewer. You can do that through uh, what was Publons. It's now been um, taken over by Web of Science. You know, you can register your keywords, your, your publications, so that you can, you know, uh, start to get asked to review um, uh, papers that are in your specific subject matter. Um, things that are within your control are time management, the behavior, your, your tone of your review, um, your ability to recognize bias and conflicts of interests, um, your ability to do your homework and to, to really research and, and to network. Um, and so um, some of the things, some of the goals for or you're in your role are determining, uh, first of all, whether the author's claims are actually supported. Um, you're supposed to, or ideally, you're going to help the journal editors make their decision. You're going to provide them with enough information that they can make uh, an informed decision about whether or not that manuscript should be published. Um, and you're a subject matter expert, right? So the, the journal editors, the academic editors, or whatever your journal calls them, the, the volunteers from the research community, and the uh, staff journal editors themselves, they're going to have some background in, in a broad area, but they're not going to be necessarily uh, a subject matter expert on that very particular uh, topic of research. Um, but you don't necessarily need to be an expert on all parts of the paper. We're going to talk about that in the breakout session on, you know, how much expertise do you need on every single aspect of the paper. And, you know, it's not your job to be a copy editor, um, so you don't have to fix everything, but we often see reviewers, you know, correcting typos, reworking sentences, and things like that. Somehow, I, there we go. So, I think I, yeah, the goals um, that you're going to want to remember are, like I said, providing an expert opinion. Um, one of the things we don't talk about enough, I think, is the role of a reviewer in helping authors to improve. Um, this is a really great um, aspect of the, the community, uh, community nature of, of research and peer review. It is peer review. And so, um, you know, sometimes there's a paper that has some, you know, some really nice science, um, some really nice potential, and the authors haven't carved it out um, in a way that really, you know, drives their message home and highlights it in a way that is, is is really great. And this is a, a, a point in which reviewers can really help with that. Um, I, uh, earlier last year, um, had a, a paper come across my desk in which one of the reviewers was uh, somebody who was very well known and very high up in, in the world of, of climate change. And there was a, a paper that just really needed some help. The science was there, um, but this reviewer just really, despite you know being a very senior scientist, took the time and the paper got published and it looked great and had a lot of media attention. And so their um, reviewers can really help with that. Um, giving the kind of feedback that you would like to receive. So not being a jerk, essentially, um, you know, and we do see that, unfortunately, with reviewers sometimes. So being transparent, being being um, diplomatic and and being respectful, um, but but, you know, in a constructively critical way, um, respecting your time, the editor's time, the author's time and recognizing when you don't have time. Um, communicating with the journal if you spot issues, being aware of potential biases, either amongst the authors and other people, uh, for yourself, conflict of interest. And uh, at the end of the day, remembering to be confident there is a reason that you specifically were asked to review this paper. So let's say you get an invitation and you wanna determine whether or not you should respond to it. So some of the things, do you have the right expertise? Um, do you have the time and can you be objective? These are all really key factors in accepting a, an invitation. So what if the topic is really interesting to you, but you don't really know a lot about it? You know, I mean, you remember it from school, but it's not your specific focus of research. Or let's say you're overextended. This is a great paper. You really want to review it, but you're about to go on vacation. Uh, this week, you're just bogged down by teaching lectures. Perhaps you should think about not. Um, accepting that if you're not going to have the time or if you're friends with the author. So, you know, in, in especially small niche communities, you're generally going to know who authors are. But the question is, like, do you go golfing with them on the weekend <laughs> or um, are, do you vacation with them and their family um, or have you um, do you have grants 
that are, you know, are in the same grant grants funded together, or, you know, recent publications together. Um, and this brings us to competing interests, and, and we're going to talk about this a little bit more. So the idea of what is a competing interest. So it's a little bit flexible the de or um, subjective, the definition. And so the key is to declare anything you might think is a, a competing interest. So let's say you published with one of the authors back in 1987, and you haven't talked to them since or published with them since, declare it, but it's probably not going to be an issue. The journal is not going to come back and say, sorry, you can't review this paper. Or likewise, if you published last month with a reviewer, with one of the authors, sorry, but um, maybe there were 30 people, 30 authors on the paper, and you've never actually even met this person, and you didn't interact with them in, in the creation of this manuscript. Again, you want to declare that, but it's probably not going to be an issue for the journal. They're probably not going to. And declaring it allows that um, the editors of that journal to be able to make that decision um, and make that assessment. And, and at least it's transparent, right? So, because the worst thing is if you're if you're reviewing for somebody who's your buddy, who's your friend, and it comes to light and their paper end up ends up getting retracted because of it. So that's where you don't want to go with this um, because of a non-disclosed conflict of interest. And so if you're on the same grant, if you have financial or you know professional or personal uh, possible competing interests, go ahead and declare those in advance and let the journal or the editors assess whether that matters to them or not. Um, and here's just a quick, you know, breakdown of how to check for competing interests. Um, you know, you can just, I would say use common sense, but you can easily, sometimes if, you know, you have no idea you've published with somebody because it's, you know, again, it was on a paper with, you know, 30 authors, 50 authors, you have never even, you know, consciously heard this person's name before. So, you know, check your own citations, check Google Scholar, um, and, and just, you know, uh, do your best to um, identify, you know, if, if you have any kind of relationship um, with one of the authors. Um, when you're writing the review report, and we're going to go into this in detail in the breakout session, so I'm just going to gloss over it here. You want to be sure to summarize all the research and your overall impression. Let the editors know, let everyone know, the authors know that you've actually read their paper and understood it. Um, provide evidence and examples. You're going to have probably identify major and minor issues, um, and then your other miscellaneous remarks. You know, line 467 needs a period instead of a question mark. You know, there you get those kind of comments in there, and they're they are helpful in, in polishing up and cleaning a manuscript up. So, what to write, and and what to expect to be written. So, again, you want examples and evidence to back up your statements. They can't be subjective. This is still a scientific paper, and your review should be equally um, scientific and objective. Talk about what you liked. Um, this is always a really nice thing to do, especially you know if you're an early career researcher and you get um, a, a review back, and and they're being very kind, even if they end up you know saying there's major revisions or or um, the paper can't be published. At least um, at least they're being kind. Um, don't talk about yourself and your research. Um, and, you know, don't provide a list of 10 of your own publications and insist that the authors um, include those. If the paper is on uh, iron fertilization, don't write two paragraphs on, you know, nitrogen cycling unless it's really relevant. Um, and don't focus on small things like the type, like typos. I mean, you can feel free to correct them, but they don't need a paragraph on, on typos um, unless you feel they're really, you know, substantial and then ask the authors to have their paper copy edited. And uh, keep your recommendations bounded by the scope of the study in front of you. Um, again, I, like I say, be professional, be respectful, be clear and concise structure your points so they're easy to follow. Make sure those authors know what you're actually asking for. Um, write about the manuscript and not the authors. And some of these may sound like common sense, but you'd be surprised what people write. And keep the, in mind the author's perspective. Um, I'll, we're gonna go into um, examples in the breakout session of this. So I'm not gonna go into detail here, but you know, identify both major and minor uh, and, and you know, um, points that you want to have addressed um, minor points, you might not actually insist that they're addressed, it just might be a comment that you want to make. And um, what we'll talk about, and you will see in the, uh, the breakout session, is how does reviewing help you to be a good author? And when you start looking at the peer review process, it's hard to not go, oh, 
I could, I could change that in my own paper. Oh, this is what I need to do. It's really handy to review papers and to look at where I'm going to, uh, I put a link in the break if you didn't see it and it's in your handout of a couple um, peer reviewed papers where the peer review has been published in plus one. Please feel free to scroll through these um, and look at them in depth. It's a great way to see a peer review process without, um, without having to actually go through the process yet. This is a link to um, our reviewer center and you can use this. It is again, journal agnostic. It helps you no matter what journal you are reviewing for or submitting to, it helps you get a really good idea of that. And this is a newsletter that Plus sends out that you can subscribe to. We'll put, um, if Paul hasn't already done it because he's very fast and we'll get it put to you in the break. And with that, I'm gonna stop sharing and we're gonna get into our breakout rooms to start talking about um, some of this a little bit more. And Paul, if you want to go ahead and get it. So we have a few minutes for a question and answer session. You can ask us anything you like. Um, if you don't want to ask out loud, that's totally fine. Put it in the chat and we will try and get through as many questions that you might have or comments um, uh, before we have to go. Okay. okay, I have a question. Sure. Just go first. Um, it was kind of back in one of the earlier topics we were discussing was this idea of going into uh, researchers from one country going into another country and doing research there. So this parachute research. And I'm curious how much the, as the journals, you guys look into sort of the background of the researchers to decide if they're from that country or not, because someone could be from, you know, Brazil have done a lot of their other work with there and now they're just currently in a position in France or something. Absolutely, and we see that a lot, right? Um, and so that's kind of the point of the, the questionnaire is just to, not in any kind of accusatory way, it's just to find out a bit more. And, and we often see that. We say, you know, how come there was no researchers? And they say, well, I'm actually from that country. And, and you know, and then that becomes a, a different story. So, yeah. Um, how, or am I saying that right? Do you have a question? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I have a question about uh, the requirements of becoming a reviewer. Yeah. So, for example, someone uh, hope to get uh, experience in reviewing some papers, and uh, 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 did he or she need to publish a lot of papers? So, what's the basic requirement for becoming a reviewer? Thank you. So I think different journals will have different requirements, but for the most part, if you've published even one paper, um, you know, depending on on you know the the number of um, views and citations of that paper, how important, how many times it's been referenced, um, you might be if with that one paper an expert on that very particular subject matter, and and you know uh, an editor would welcome your input. So if you've published even one paper, it is worth um, you know starting to review. Um, if no one is calling you or emailing you to invite you, you can, um, like I said, you can go on some journals websites or, or contact them, just their general info and say, I would like to become a reviewer for you. And, and we get people to do that a lot. We sign them up as a reviewer. We get all of their keywords so that when new papers come through, um, they, you know, automatically can, can, you know, establish whether you would be a good fit. So there's a number of journals that do that. So definitely you should start emailing journals if you'd like to review. And um, a lot of journals, I know our journal gives um, credit to your ORCID ID um, so that you get credit for the review so that people know and you oh. can actually list that on your, your resume and, and you know, because employers, universities, they like it when you do these kind of um, what we call service activities. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. There are also some like online communities that are not linked to journals where you can sort of like opt in to be a reviewer. So yeah, uh, one more question. Go ahead. Oh, it's me. Yeah, there you yeah. Go. 
Okay, no, it's sorry. I, I know I'm biased. I'm, I'm the other side, but uh, I want. Did you guys discuss much about the quality of the journals you are being asked to review for? I mean, if you are a young scientist and you know there's so many journals that are just unknown. Like, I mean, you know. Uh, I mean, yeah. did you guys talk a little bit about that? And yeah, we didn't go we into didn't. it in this session. Yeah, go ahead. We Dasha. usually do. No, no, you go ahead. No, um, it's something that we usually do, and and we were kind of jam. Um, and we talked about it in the um, some of the, the chats on Whova about predatory publishing, about um, how to know. And, you know, we're all researchers do a little research is my general thing. If it's a and, and work, watch out for a few things like you can have a journal name. When, sometimes they're very clever. They, they make it sound very real or instead of like journal of uh, atmospheric chemistry and physics. It's physics and atmospheric chemistry. It's like really close to like the proper journal's name. So it's easy to get confused. So, you know, Google Google the, the journal. If, if it's not one you really recognize, then you're being invited to review for them. So Hannah, what were you going to say? Sorry. Uh, no, like more or less exactly what Natasha said. And like, because we've done similar presentations as well, where we talk about like, you know, profit versus like non-profit publishing and, you know, like open, like journals that are really open and transparent and journals that are, you know, profiting a lot from the, the work that they do. And like, all I can say is, you know, I encourage you also to sort of have a think about this when you're publishing and reviewing to sort of like see if this is a journal that you'd like to volunteer for if they seem to be doing good work that you'd like to support with your volunteer hours um and then yeah we don't have time to talk about all of that in detail but there is a lot of information online about like way why you might want to support certain journals or like you know um and there are some journals that could be like natasha saying like predatory or trying to basically just take everyone's money and everyone's time and not give anything back to the community and that's you know can be problematic so. I always say that you wouldn't go on your weekend and volunteer for a worldwide package delivery company, or you wouldn't go to your supermarket and, you know, for free, just benefit them, offer to, you know, work there. So why do we as scientists constantly offer our time for, for those kind of companies? Um, I, would, I would challenge you to think about that, and all of you. Okay. So, because I'm the uh, the chair here, and and uh, I'm gonna take a prerogative, make a final comment, and then we transition to the poster session. But one last thing, I want to share a quick uh, story that I had recently regarding myself writing a review paper. Uh, I had to go through the pain of asking for uh, permission to use figures, and. And it was a pain because it was like six figures from different journals. And then I just ran into, you know, this issue of, you know, copyrights being owned by somebody else. So clearly you as young author, uh, pay attention to those copyright things because you are giving up the right of your image being used by somebody else and somebody else charging for your images. So for example, I had to, I wanted to use an image of a paper published in 1976. The authors had already died. Uh, the editorial company owning that, they replied a customary message that they wanted uh, $40 for that image. So it was a pain and, see, and you know, uh, just be mindful. That's another reason to do open, you know, journals like PLOS or Copernicus. So remember that because you will pay, pay it down the road and your colleagues. Use your own image. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So anyways, so transition to a poster session. We, this is the torture part for someone, uh, the very informative ones for others. Uh, I think I have a list of 15 people. Uh, I don't know if that is still the case, but the goal here is that do your presentation in one minute, tell me, your uh, research project, the main result, uh, you know, of course, you're going to synthesize everything you had just learned. Um, yeah, and try to be on time. That's the goal here to practice that. And then if, if there is energy, we do some Q&A at the end. Okay, so how do we go? Is this the, uh, the lineup? So I guess we go with Excel first. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Um, can you hear me? I do. Okay. Uh, so my name is Axel, and I'm a PhD candidate at University of Liège in Belgium. 
And my project is uh, CO2 and CH4 fluxes among the atmosphere, sea ice, water columns, sediment continuum, and the impact of ice cover on these fluxes. So I'm going to work in the West Antarctic Peninsula, which is a place uh, where the climate change has a very active uh, impact. So what I'm going to do is that I'm going to um, calculate fluxes at the air, sea ice, and air water uh, interface, and also at the benthic level. And also uh, concentration of CO2 and CH4 in the air, in the ice, in the water column, and in the sediment using a new extraction uh, system for the ice. And with all these results, I'm going to compute and integrate them on the continuum to see uh, the impact of um, ice cover on all these fluxes and concentration. So if you are interested, um, contact me and uh, I will answer your question. Thank you. Very good. OK. Hello, everyone. I'm Subodip, a PhD student at the ex University in France. And my poster is about the nitrogen fixation in the Southern Indian Ocean. We sampled through the Swinx geotraces boost from the Southern Indian Ocean and measured the nitrogen fixation activity, also the abundance of different potential diazotrope groups and their community composition by NEFH Amplicon studies. What we found that the above the subtropical front close to the Madagascar, relatively higher nitrogen fixation rate detected. Below the front, there is no nitrogen fixation. And we found a quite interesting things in terms of the QPCR abundance, like the Trichodesmium and UCYN group. They are co-occurring, which is quite unique with respect to the other ecosystem because it's anti-correlate. And in terms of the community composition, proteobacteria is overall winning the diazotrope community. And the main take-home message co-occurring of UCYNA and Trichodesmium. Uh, and the temperature is a key factor in controlling the nitrogen fixation. And uh, above the subtropical front, there are cyanobacterial abundance. Below it, there is a proteobacterial abundance with sulfur and iron reducing mechanism. So feel free to ask a question. I'll be happy to answer. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, do you hear me? Uh, yes. Yes. Yeah, okay. Yes. Uh, so my name is Charlotte, and I'm a PhD student at the LISA at in France. And uh, so the purpose of my research is to look at the chemi vari chemical variation of the precipitation which goes into the water oceanic surface because it brings some nutrition and pollutants for the development of the phytoplankton. And to have a link with this, we can try to make a link with the chemical composition of particulate matter which goes in, in precipitation and which is generated by uh, different influences uh, that can impact the constitution of air masses, such as uh, industrial activities or desertic activities. So we can look, for example, if uh, there is soot, which is associated with particulate matter in our sample. And this is also interesting to see because uh, nutrition with uh, the industrial activities are more uh, assimilated uh, for, by the phytoplankton than the one uh, uh, by the, the influence of the, the desertic influence. And, but they can also be assimilated with some um, contaminants uh, that are toxic with, uh, for the phytoplankton. Uh, so if you have uh, more questions with my research, you can contact me. Thank you. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, hi, my name is Dennis, and I'm a PhD student working at the Institute of Environmental Physics at Heidelberg University in Germany. And in my research, I'm studying acid gas exchange in the lab, uh, focusing on the mass boundary layer. This term means the upper 10 to 350 micrometers below the water surface that Tom introduced yesterday as diffusive sublayer. The reason for its importance is that here gas, uh, gas exchange takes place dominantly by the very slow molecular diffusion rather uh, than by turbulence. Using a technique known as boundary layer imaging, we are able to visualize concentration ratios um, of a trace gas in this layer and measure the thickness of it. Uh, so we can get spatially resolved and instantaneous information about the transfer velocity. This offers a unique possibility in contrast to the many conventional methods that only measure average values. If you are interested in how I create 
these nice green uh, boundary layer images as shown on the right side. Feel free and visit my poster. Thank you. Yeah, hello everyone. My name is Lisa Gassen and um, I'm working in the Institute of Chemistry and Biology of the Marine Environment and my work focuses on the influence of precipitation on the sea surface and I look especially at the sea surface salinity because it's a key indicator to detect freshwater fluxes across the ocean. And on my poster, you can see the results of a sampling campaign we did with our catamaran. And it can sample the SML and also the bulk water. And we did that during two rain events. So here you can see that especially the wind and also um, evaporation processes has a strong influence on um, changes of the uh, sea surface salinity and also the temperature and also um, on the underlying bulk water. And what we also measure was um, to uh, temperature and also salinity fronts, which cannot only occur um, on the SML. So here you can see that it's so important to consider the SML as an independent water mass um, due to its very special hydrological characters. Thank you a lot. And if you have any questions, please don't um, hesitate to ask. Thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, sorry, my camera is not working. Uh, my name is Nabil Mamun. I am a PhD student at the Alfred Regional Institute in Germany. Uh, my poster is about uncertainty in ocean biogeochemical models. Uh, these ocean biological models are highly uncertain in, on, on the parameterization. Uh, that means that uh, uh, uncertainty quantification is actually a parameterization problem. In this study, I estimated 10 pre selected parameters of a one dimensional biogeochemical model applying ensemble data simulation in two locations. I assimilated satellite chlorophyll concentration and in situ next primary production data. Uh, the estimated set of parameters improve the model and reduce their uncertainty in general, as we can see in the top right uh, figure. Uh, we found that correlation between parameters preclude identification of a single optimal set of parameters. That's why we need actually large ensemble. Uh, modeling. Thank you very much. If uh, you have any question, please write in the Huba. Okay. Hi, everybody. My name is Brandy Robinson. I'm a postdoctoral researcher in Oliver Worlds Group in Germany. Our group's research focuses on the sea surface microlayer, and my research focuses on, in particular on gel-like particles or EPS particles, which help to form and stabilize the SML, as well as transport organic matter in the ocean. So in 2018, I had the opportunity to take our catamaran on a research cruise to the central Arctic and deploy it in an open lead to take large volume sea surface microlayer and underlying water samples. And so the results of this are presented in the poster here. So what we found was that the SML was enriched compared to the underlying water for most substances, but that overall concentrations of our EPS particles and surfactants were actually quite low, which was really surprising for me since we know that ice is quite permeated with these EPS particles. Additionally, our EPS particles actually decreased in the second half of the campaign. And we have some interesting theories of why this occurred, but if you wanna know more about it, you have to check out the poster. Thank you. Hi, I'm Nils Lettberg, a PhD candidate at the Alfred Wegener Institute. I'm currently working on marine cold air outbreaks, or MCAOs, in the front strait between Svalbard and Greenland. And since these cold, dry air masses can extract a lot of heat from the ocean in the form of sensible and latent heat fluxes, Changes in the MCAOs uh, may alter both atmospheric and oceanic properties. Uh, and as for the atmosphere, we have found that the cold anomalies associated with these MCAOs extend throughout the entire troposphere, um, with less cooling 
near the surface over the open water where where the fluxes um, uh, warm the air mass from below, inducing convection during the event. But what I'm trying to figure out if is if this also induces long-term climate feedbacks uh, because of the altered stability in the atmosphere, as well as the uh, stratification in the ocean and ultimately the ocean circulation. So if you want to know more, please write me an email or so. Hi everyone, I'm Lucas. I'm a master's student at the University of Heidelberg in Germany, and I'm working with Bern Diana and also Dennis, who presented his poster earlier today on air sea gas exchange, and we're conducting experiments in our wind wave tank DR Ultron. Um, so maybe you remember the different gas exchange field measurement techniques that Tom presented yesterday, like the added covariance and the dual tracer technique. But there's actually another technique that we currently use in a laboratory called thermography, um, which looks very promising and has a better temporal resolution than most of the techniques that were presented yesterday. Um, so me and my group are currently planning a series of experiments for next month. And if you want to know more about that um, technique, the thermography technique, and also about our new approaches and idea that we have and that we hope will aid the community to make a move forward in that field. Um, I would encourage you to have a look at my poster or speak to me or Dennis. Thanks. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so my name is Emmanuel Schlesser. I'm a first year PhD student at the National University of Ireland, Galway, um, more precisely at the Center for Climate and Pollution Studies. And my work consists in um, assessing the chemical composition and physical properties of marine aerosol sampled at my said research station, which is a which is a research station on the um, on the west coast of Ireland. So our work consisted in using an instrument called a high-resolution thermophyte aerosol mass spectrometer to investigate nitrate, sulfate, ammonium, chloride, sea salt, and more especially uh, organic uh, aerosol composition. So we looked into detail with source apportionment algorithms on the uh, fraction of these aerosols, whether they were coming from certain species, which you can see here on these plots. And we looked at the air masses using Lagrangian models to have an idea of the sources above the Northeast Atlantic. So if you have any question or wish to discuss about all of this, feel free to catch up any time and yep. Whoa, is it? Oh, I thought it were done. We are not. Are we done? Are we done? So we just go to back to the, uh, let me put it in gallery. Uh, Okay, so, sorry everyone if I was too uh, having the <laughs> the bell right there, uh, but we were on time. This were very good uh, scene. I mean, I I have to say the uh, overall they were very good. I mean, I think you guys were mostly on time, maybe five seconds over. That was okay. I think the main comment. Remember, uh, sometime in life you will be standing next to an important person for which you have to say something very fast and very important. And that's, you have exactly 15 seconds, the elevator pitch. This is what it is for. So you have to practice it, it's practice, practice, because that, that little speech will give you something. You don't know when it's gonna happen. So it just, you know, still happen myself nowadays and I have to practice it. So, uh, Remember, it's just the effort and sometimes it just, you know, it's not very pleasant, but you know, you, 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 you will notice this was good. So uh, anyway, so I think uh, this was an extremely uh, enjoyable session. Uh, I don't know if, you, if there is any experience you would like to share. Uh, for example, this experience about the one minute thing, like I said, it was not very, but do you have any comment? Is, do you feel like it was useful? Uh, anyways. Feedback, you're really, mic is open. Um, I mean, it's been four hours, so I can understand. Maybe you're tired, so that's okay too. Uh, so anyways, uh, if that is the case, if there are no, oh, you have Lisa. So yeah, go ahead, Lisa, yeah. We'll... 
Are, are we allowed to ask questions about the posters? Um, I think so, yeah. Yeah, I actually have a question for Brandy, who I see her hands up now. Good to see you again, Brandy. <laughs> I'm just wondering, did you guys manage to get any oxygen 18 measurements? No, so, so I should say specifically our group didn't. We weren't, it was just me out there in that kind of run, so I didn't take oxygen 18. And we, I was mostly focused on the water side of this as well. Uh, no, I mean oxygen 18 in the water. In the water, but, yeah, no. But there was no one on the ship doing that, that you could um, like buy them beer? For, <laughs> yeah, so I, the, there was the ice group, um, but they never came to the open lead. We had the open lead group out there and then we had the ice people and the ice people, I think did, but then they were never over near our site. But even if they weren't at your site, if they were getting yeah. oxygen 18 from the surface waters, that would give you some insight into uh, the extent to which the waters were impacted by river versus ice melt, which could provide a lot of interesting um, insight into your um, microlayer composition. We can talk later. Yeah, I was like, now we're going to, now I need to. <laughs> Okay, well, um, if nothing uh, pops up, uh, Brandy, your hand is still is up. Oh, yeah. I I'm sure you want to talk to you. It was just a comment thing because now, having okay. done the one minute presentation, okay. actually, I think it really was good practice because uh, I haven't actually had to do that version of it before. And I realized I've always done talks where by minute two or three, I'm comfortable with what I'm saying and I'm okay. And I've never realized that if you have to shove it into one minute, that's just the really intense nervous part. And there's none of the calming down afterwards. And I was like, oh, that's a really interesting experience for me, actually. It was a really good thing to go through. Because before I went through it, I was like, oh, this daughter, I've never done it. It'll be okay. We'll see how it goes. Now, having done it, I'm really grateful we have this here. Yeah. yeah. The other comment I, I would add is that remember not only you yourself giving the talk, but also when you had to experience everybody else's presentation and you start to compare with your own. Okay, oh, look at this, all these figures. I mean, the, oh, why so much text? I cannot follow anything. So remember, that's what, when you're delivering that speech, that's what people are receiving. So you're, what you're receiving is, I have to deal with so many figures, so many texts. So be, mind, be mindful of what images you are provided. Huh? So anyways, so I guess that's uh, my final comment. Uh, I guess I'm gonna yield to, the chairperson of this, master of all, uh, Krista. Okay. <laughs> um, I think that's basically the end. Um, thank you. I don't know what time the session is tomorrow. Does anyone know off the top of the head the time for tomorrow? I think it's four hours later than we started today. It, 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 it is later. Yeah. yeah, it is later. So I, I think it's um, it's um, 1500 UTC if I'm if I'm correct. So 3 p.m. UTC. So we see you guys back here tomorrow at 3 p.m. UTC. Have a good one. Good. Bye bye. <laughs>